Chapter 1. Adeline Sharp sat at the head of the table, her head resting on one hand, watching the party swirl on around her. She felt detached from it all, as if she'd been submerged into some social experiment. She was sitting in the experiment, observing, but she wasn't a part of it. A lot of people had shown up, and they all seemed to be having a great time, they were constantly laughing, talking over one another, and sipping fancy drinks from fancy glasses. She was glad she'd given them an opportunity for such merriment. She was also lonely. Though this was a party for her birthday, she was pretty sure that no one would notice if she slipped out. In fact, she probably would before it was over. She'd never been much of a drinker, and the more these people drank, the more she would want to escape their company. She didn't understand how she could even be lonely in one of the biggest cities in the country, but the longer she lived in Las Vegas, the lonelier she felt. It didn't make sense. She had friends. Sort of. Or at least, she had people she was friendly with. And five nights a week, she danced on stage for hundreds of people. So why did she feel like a cork bobbing around in a cold ocean? Has she opened her gifts yet? Jasmine, one of the friendlies, asked. She didn't know anyone had brought gifts. They determined, without consulting her, that no, she hadn't opened any gifts yet. She scanned the small banquet room they'd rented for the occasion, but she didn't see any wrapping paper. Yes, let's open the presents. Heather cried. They were going to be disappointed when they realized that there was nothing to open. But then Jasmine managed to produce a small gift bag from under the table. We all chipped in, she said, beaming. Oh, that made more sense. Thirty people had chipped in for one gift. She took it, grateful for the gesture, and pulled a piece of sparkly tissue paper out of the top of a bag to reveal an object wrapped in more tissue paper. She pulled it out and sensing it was fragile, carefully unwrapped it. It was a frosted wine glass. Etched into the glass were the words aging like fine wine. She gave them her best stage smile and thanked them. Then she tried to tuck the gift back into the bag. There's wine in there too. Heather sang out triumphantly. I see that, she said, though she had only seen it once it had been pointed out. She thanked them again. It was a nice gift. It didn't match her life at all, but it was the thought that counted, right? Within 30 seconds, they had all gone back to their previous conversation, and the gift-giving part of the evening was over. As often happened on her birthday, the conversation turned to New Year's Eve. Everyone started excitedly discussing which parties they were going to. Adeline had planned on going to a small gathering that one of her co-workers was having, but she didn't say that, because no one asked her. Her phone beeped. She glanced down, only a social media notification. She would have ignored it, but she caught a glimpse of a name, Colton. She clicked to see that Colton Bridge had posted happy birthday. On her page. Her heart beat a little faster, and she silently tried to tell it that this wasn't a big deal. This app made it very easy to make a happy birthday post, and lots of people did it. Every year, she got a flood of birthday wishes, many from people she didn't ever remember meeting in real life. In fact, she was pretty sure that this wasn't the first time that Colton had wished her a happy birthday via this app. So it wasn't a big deal. Her heart disagreed. So she reminded it that if Colton Bridge were posting happy birthday on her wall, then he was likely doing it to everybody else too. It wasn't like they'd kept in touch in any other way. She hadn't talked to him since high school. Her breath caught as two wires connected in her brain, shooting sparks in every direction. It was almost New Year's Eve. And this was her 30th birthday. She had almost forgotten about their pact. Had he? Wait, how had the pact gone again? She'd said, when we are 30. Was he 30? She searched her brain, trying to remember his birthday. She was sure she'd known it once. Oh yes, his terrible girlfriend had brought birthday cupcakes to school during football season. So that meant that yes, he was 30. Just like her. The pact was in play. You look like you just saw a ghost, Heather said. Something like that, yeah. Actually, I'm not feeling well. I think I'm going to head. But Heather was already on to the next thing before Adeline could finish the sentence. 
she stood and grabbed her coat. The cold desert air felt good, but she still hurried to get home. Her neighborhood was well lit, and there were lots of people around, but she never really felt completely safe anywhere in the city. Part of her really missed her South Dakota home, but her career was here, which meant that her life was here. And she did love her career. Her life? Not so much. She felt guilty for not being content. She had a dream life, really. But it felt like something was missing. And if something wasn't missing, if this was what life was all about, then life was overrated. She made it into her apartment, took off her coat, and kicked off her boots. Then she collapsed onto the couch. Colton Bridge. The crush of all crushes. She rarely thought about him anymore. But she was certainly thinking about him now. Because 12 years ago, at a terribly awkward high school New Year's Eve party gone wrong, they had made each other a promise. Back then, 30 had seemed so far away. So old. Like they'd never get there. Didn't seem that way now. Chapter 2 Thank you for coming in, Mr. Bridge, Sally Oxford said from behind her giant mahogany desk. Colton had been happy to come in. He'd been waiting for her call for days. Of course. He gave her a smile that she did not return. Uh-oh. While of course he'd been nervous, he hadn't really thought that the bank would turn him down. He had done everything right. He'd worked so hard. Jumped through all the hoops. Been so patient. Why not, he said before she could tell him that his loan had been denied. Well, hold on. It's not a no. It's more of a not yet. Not yet? He'd been working on this for years. He didn't know how much more not yet he could stomach. Your business plan looks good, but our underwriters are concerned that you don't have enough business education or experience. I've watched Timmy run that gym for more than a decade. But that isn't the same as running it yourself. She folded her hands on the desk and looked at him, not unkindly. What about a cosigner? If you had someone to cosign your loan, I think we could push it through. But he didn't have anyone. And even if he did, he was 30 years old. He didn't want to be like some needy teenager begging his parents to lend him their credit. He shook his head. What about your family's ranch? Could put that up as collateral? He almost laughed. That land belonged to all of his brothers. Not even a possibility. But he was suddenly too tired to explain that, so he only shook his head again. What about Denver? She raised her eyebrows. Colton almost growled. He was definitely not going to ask his movie star brother to co-sign a loan for him. He couldn't stand the man. I'm sorry that you wasted your time. He put his hat on and stood. Though his legs were in the best shape of his life, they suddenly felt weak. He thanked her out of habit, though she hadn't done much to be thankful for. Mr. Bridge, wait, she called after him, but he kept going. There were other banks in town, well, two other banks, anyway. He'd had accounts with this one his whole life, but maybe another one would be willing to work with him. And if not, maybe he could find a business loan online. He headed out into the cold South Dakota wind and jumped into his truck. He was going to have to come up with a plan B quickly, or Timmy might sell the gym to someone else. Colton didn't know if anyone else was interested, but he didn't want to take the chance. He had to act soon. And if he was going to visit another bank, he should do it tomorrow because the day after that was New Year's Day, and everything would be closed. Then they'd be into the weekend. He got angry then, angry that the bank had taken so much time to tell him no. They might have ruined his chances. Stupid holiday. Even if no one else made Timmy an offer in the next few days, after New Year's the gym would be absolutely slammed. January was the best time of the year for the gym. Money poured in like Noah's flood. Colton would be too busy to get to the bank then. Clients clutching their resolutions would be lined up out the door. Frustrated, he pounded his hand on the steering wheel. Stupid bank. Expecting him to pony up his brother's land. Wait. The land. Months ago, they briefly talked about buying Denver out. Maybe they would buy him out? 
maybe he could sell his portion of the ranch? He had no use for it. He never had. He was going to have to talk to his brothers again. And he was going to have to do it soon. He pulled into a parking lot to call his oldest brother Gunner, the only one living on the family ranch, and saw that he had a text from one of his clients. Carissa had invited him to a New Year's Eve party the following night. No thanks. He'd rather sit on his couch alone and watch the ball drop. This thought made him feel old. And feeling old made him remember something that he hadn't thought of in a long time. He almost laughed aloud. Adeline Sharp. They'd made a promise. They'd even called it a pact. Everything had been so dramatic in high school. They'd promised each other that if they weren't married by the time they were 30, then they would meet at the football field at midnight on New Year's Eve and that they would marry each other. What idiots. At the time, he'd been head over heels in love with Danielle Billings. He'd been so sure that he'd marry her that he'd thought sure, Adeline was a great backup plan. If Danielle broke his heart, then Adeline would be a nice warm safe place to go for comfort. Danielle had not turned out to be the woman he wanted her to be, and his love had grown cold soon after graduation, but Colton had forgotten all about Adeline. Where even was she? She'd gone off to college somewhere out of state. Los Angeles? Las Vegas? He couldn't remember. Surely she'd forgotten about their little pact? But what if she hadn't? He opened his social media app to look for updates on her life and saw that he had just wished her a happy birthday. He'd set his app to do that automatically for everyone. Usually people thanked him, but Adeline hadn't responded. Did that mean something? Maybe it meant she'd forgotten he existed. She was likely wondering why some weirdo was posting on her page. Or maybe it meant she hadn't logged into her account today. It probably didn't mean anything, and yet he found himself staring down at that automated message, hoping she would hit the little heart beneath it. Chapter 3 Adeline threw the covers off and sat up. She glanced at the clock. It was nearly one. She didn't know why she was so restless. She was usually plenty exhausted enough to sleep. She dragged herself to her kitchen and poured some cereal and milk into a bowl, which she carried back to bed. She switched on the TV and started streaming out a range. She'd already seen every episode multiple times, but she hadn't grown tired of it yet. Nevertheless, as her crunching drowned out the voices on the screen, her eyes kept drifting to her closed closet door. So once she drunk the sweetened milk from the bowl, she padded over to that door and swung it open. It took some digging. She couldn't remember which box she tucked her high school memorabilia into. She was about to give up when she kicked a tote that was heavy enough to give her hope. Sure enough, there they were. The West Hope High School yearbooks. She grabbed them and took them back to her bed, only feeling a little foolish. She switched on the lamp and cracked open the oldest book. It smelled like an old bookstore. It seemed appropriate that she could now hear Outer Range playing in the background because looking at these black and white pictures felt like time travel. She ran her hand over the page. There she was, 14 years old. It had taken years of focused self-development to get to the point where she didn't cringe at pictures like this. She'd been so embarrassed to look like she'd looked back then, and that pain had carried well into her adulthood. She was grateful that it was gone now. All she had now was sympathy and affection for that awkward, insecure young woman. That girl had had no idea what she was capable of, and she'd spent so much time hiding. Adeline ran her fingertips over her own young face and then turned the page. And there we was. Colton Bridge. What a goofy-looking kid he'd been back then, and she'd already had her crush. It was hard to believe now. What had she seen in that skinny frame? Those Dumbo ears? If she'd relied on her memory, she would have sworn that he'd already been gorgeous by freshman year, but here was her evidence that her memory was a liar. At least where Colton Bridge was concerned. What else was she misremembering? Maybe he hadn't been all that special. It's not like she'd had a lot to choose from back then in Tiny West Hope. Teenage girls will have their crushes. Maybe he hadn't been all that crushworthy. After a brief visit to see herself on the band page, she flipped to football for another look at Colton. 
They hadn't given him much yearbook real estate as a freshman, but being the star he was, he'd gotten a color action shot. She smiled, remembering the sight of him flying up the field. Maybe that's what had done her heart in, when he'd been wearing his helmet, she hadn't been able to see his ears. She closed the book and moved on to their sophomore year. Now the candidates showed him with Danielle, and all these years later, the sight still made her curl her lip. If the pictures told the truth, Colton hadn't bulked up much between freshman and sophomore years, and his ears still looked like parasails. But by junior year, the shift had started. He was thicker, and the pictures showed Danielle holding on a little tighter. Now three of the five action shots on the football spread were of him. The other two were of his brother Riker. She wondered how Riker was doing these days. She knew that he'd been hurt pretty bad in a fire. She hoped he was okay. He'd been a nice guy back then, even nicer than Colton. Colton. High school seemed like so long ago. It didn't even feel real. It was like a standard definition movie she'd watched years ago on a small screen. And if Colton felt the same way, if high school was just a foggy memory for him too, then surely he wasn't going to show up at a high school football field at midnight in December? Right? But what if he did? The whole silly pact had been her idea. Not that she'd planned it. She hadn't. It had just popped out of her mouth. She'd been emboldened by the cold, the dark, the revelry of New Year's Eve, and the words had just bubbled out of her. She wasn't so delusional to think that if she didn't show up now, twelve years later, that Colton Bridge was going to be emotionally crushed. Or even injured. But wouldn't it make her look like a jerk? She flipped open the last yearbook. And there he was. The senior version. All bulked up like a man. A football star. In color. His senior quotation, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. She had been so in love. She had to go to West Hope. She didn't think he would show up, but she couldn't shake that one question, what if he did? With the yearbook open in her lap, she picked up her phone and searched for a flight to Rapid City, South Dakota. Chapter 4 Colton was at the gym, enjoying the calm before the storm. While the storm would make the gym a lot of money, and he was grateful for that, it still felt very much like a storm, and storms weren't fun. Colton was trying to focus on Carissa, one of his few one-on-one -on -one clients, but he couldn't stop worrying about whether or not to show up at a high school football field in the middle of the night. He was 99% sure that Adeline would not show up. She didn't even live in West Hope anymore. But what if she did show up? He couldn't stand her up. She'd been such a nice girl. One of the few girls in the whole school who'd been kind to everyone. She'd been so smart. He blushed remembering how she used to make him study guides for hard tests. And how welcoming she was when new kids showed up at youth group. Adeline Sharp had been special. He wouldn't hurt her feelings for the world. As if she could read his mind, Carissa asked if he had plans tonight. Oh shoot. She'd already texted him and asked him out, and he hadn't answered her. Distracted by Adeline, he'd forgotten all about it. Now, to avoid rejecting her, he made an on-the-spot decision. Yes, he had plans tonight. Carissa was obviously disappointed, and he tried not to feel guilty. He had no reason to because he'd never done anything to lead Carissa on, but still, it was tough to hurt her feelings because he was pretty sure that she liked him quite a bit. It was the only explanation for why she was still coming to the gym. It was obvious that she had no interest in actual weightlifting. In fact, he was pretty sure that she was purposefully underachieving, as if that would make her seem more feminine and thus more attractive to him which proved that she didn't know him at all. Now she was pretending that she couldn't lift the barbell. She wasn't shaking or anything. She was just holding the barbell suspended in midair, which took more muscle than lifting it. He helped her because it was his job, and he tried to hide his annoyance. He was frequently trying to hide his annoyance with Carissa. She was the only client he'd ever had who giggled manically every time he spoke. Thanks. She giggled when he put the barbell on the rack. 
if she'd truly been straining, she wouldn't have the energy to giggle. She dabbed at her dry, well-made-up face with a towel. What are your plans? He was not going to tell her that he planned to go stand in the cold alone, staring at a field of snow. Time for triceps. He left her sitting on the bench, not really caring whether she followed. When their interminable session was finally over, she had accidentally brushed up against him as she thanked him for an invigorating session and then spun around so fast that she whacked him with her ponytail, which was so full of product that the contact stung a little. He was grateful that he wouldn't have to see Carissa for another week. And as soon as he owned this gym, he would assign her to someone else. When his shift was over, he took a long shower. You better not be showering on company time again. Timmy called through the door. Colton rolled his eyes. He was off the clock. I wouldn't dream of it, he yelled back. Are you going to lock up? Yep, I've got it. Thanks. Happy New Year's. Colton winced as he held his face up to the stream. Another New Year's. Another year had come and gone. And what did he have to show for it? Nothing. He sighed and turned around, letting the water massage his neck. This holiday used to feel so hopeful. Now it instilled a sense of panic. No, he told himself. This year would be different. He was going to buy the gym. He just had to talk to his brothers. Then things were going to change. That's right. This was going to be a year of change. Next year, on New Year's Eve, he would look back on this year and hardly recognize it. Things would be so different. Chapter 5 Adeline looked at her watch. This was ridiculous. She'd actually committed to this foolhardy mission, and now she was going to miss it because the plane wouldn't move to the gate. Adeline had always had a weird relationship with anger. Everyone thought that she never got angry, but that wasn't true. She felt anger. She just never showed it. She pushed it down either through eating calming foods or dancing manically, sometimes she ate calming foods and then danced manically in order to burn off those extra calories. Twice, this had made her sick, but still, she hadn't shown her anger. This method of hers had a downside. Sometimes she packed her anger down so tight that she eventually blew her lid and acted completely unhinged. She was in a crowded airplane stuck on the tarmac, and she was about to come unhinged. A few passengers had already done so. The well-dressed woman two rows in front of her stood up and yelled a long string of wrathful syllables. They sounded like French, and though Adeline didn't know a lick of French, she didn't think the woman was saying nice things. Then the woman climbed onto her seat and squatted there. What on earth? A flash of fur zipped by Adeline's feet. What was that? A cat? A rabid badger? Had she stumbled into a sequel to Snakes on a Plane? A little girl screamed that she had blood dripping down her leg, the woman beside her screamed that her pants had been ripped. Badgers on a plane. Where was the FBI agent who would save them all? The man beside Adeline unbuckled his seatbelt and ordered her to let him out just as the flight attendant ordered everyone to calm down. Adeline gave her neighbor some side eye. Where are you going to go? It was rhetorical. There was nowhere to go. He elbowed her, and his voice shook with panic as he said, Get out of my way. Touch me again, and I'll break your arm. His eyes widened. He was now more scared of her than he was of the cat badger. He pushed himself into the bulkhead as if that would make him smaller. Adeline didn't know if she could really break his arm, but she'd taken a lot of self-defense classes, and she was willing to try if he kept assaulting her with his elbow. Adeline looked over her shoulder, but she couldn't see anything because everyone was standing. Someone cried out, it bit me. Then there was pounding, followed by a loud, let me in. Was someone hiding from the creature in the spacious bathroom? Adeline would rather wrestle a badger to the death than stow away in an airplane potty, especially with a roommate. The flight attendant again told everyone to return to their seats, saying that the safety crew would catch the cat. Oh, okay. So it was a cat. Adeline was a little disappointed. This would have been a better story if it had been a badger. Everyone ignored the flight attendant. There was more shrieking and claims of sightings. Where had the cat even come from? 
Adeline tried to search for the owner, but she couldn't see much around her as everyone near her, except for the cowering man beside her, was either standing or squatting in their seats. The woman across the aisle was squatting in stilettos, and one of them had poked a hole in the seat. Adeline took a deep breath. She was about to lose it, and she didn't have any peanut butter cups or room to dance. She gave her whole body a good fierce wiggle, trying to shake off some of the tension, and the cowering man gave her a judgy look. She threatened him with her eyes. A male voice interrupted the flight attendant's continued attempt at crowd control. This is your pilot. Return to your seats and buckle up, or there will be consequences at the gate. The crowd quieted. We cannot move this airplane until we are all in our seats. It will be easier to catch the cat if we can get you folks off the plane, but we can't do that until you sit down. The pilot's little speech worked. People were still vocal about their terror, but they sat down. A flight attendant with plastic gloves and a trash bag went by. What was she going to do with that? For the first time Adeline felt bad for the cat. Then she saw the cat's owner, and she felt even worse. The only passenger still standing, she was mumbling an apology on repeat with tears streaming down her face. Adeline silently prayed for both the woman and the cat. I've got it, someone behind her called out. Then, no, never mind. That cat was a slippery thing. One of the flight attendants asked the crying woman, do you have any treats for it? She sniffed, nodded, and bent to her carry-on. Adeline thought they were probably past the treat stage. Two flight attendants went up and down the aisle, but the cat remained on the move. This was completely fruitless. They needed to get these people off the plane and bring in animal control with a net. Adeline looked at her watch again. She was running out of time. If Colton showed up, and that was a big if, she didn't think he was going to sit around waiting for her. A good-looking man touched the flight attendant's arm. She looked annoyed, but she stopped to talk to him. Adeline strained to hear what he was saying, but she couldn't. He was too soft-spoken. But the flight attendant nodded and stepped back to let him out into the aisle. Everyone, the flight attendant said, this man is an animal trainer, so he and only he has permission to stand up right now. The man winced when she said animal trainer, and Adeline wondered what he really was. He had the demeanor of a cowboy. The hat too. He now took off that hat and handed it to the woman in the seat beside him, who was now also standing, though she hadn't been given permission. She cleared her throat and said with a practiced public speaking confidence, please be quiet so he can hear the cat. Raise your hand if the cat's near you right now, and then put it down if the cat moves. Brilliant. Why hadn't she thought of that? Why hadn't anyone thought of that? A wave of hands looked like unenthusiastic fans at a sparsely attended baseball game. The man stood still, watching the hands. Then he surprised Adeline by lying down in the aisle right beside her. Oh good, whatever this movie was called, she was going to get a front row seat. Coming to you on your left, the animal trainer's helper said. He rolled toward Adeline, and she pulled her feet up to give the cat a path. She nearly cried out at how much this hurt her knees, but she managed to hold the pose. And then it was right there, and his hand darted out and pushed down on its back. The cat flattened into the floor and hissed like a steam valve. It turned its head and tried to bite the man's arm, but he had a long-sleeved coat on. Shh, the man said with surprising calmness. I got you, he whispered. He scooted his body closer. I got you, he said again. Wow. Maybe he really was an animal trainer. He didn't move. Was he planning to stay there till they got to the gate? It might prove to be more than her knees could bear, but it wasn't a bad plan. How would you like me to get you back to your safe one, he whispered. Odd choice of words, but the cat stopped trying to bite him. Good, good job, okay, I got you. Slowly, he reached his other hand closer. The cat squirmed, but did not hiss or show its teeth. Adeline was stunned. Once the man had both hands on the cat, he stopped pushing so hard. And then he was gently pulling it toward his body, still whispering and talking in the most calming, cajoling voice Adeline had ever heard. Maybe he was a hypnotist. A cat hypnotist, no less. 
slowly, he got to his feet, and everyone cheered. His face registered panic, and he shushed them. Adeline glanced at his partner, who was now beaming with pride. Or maybe it wasn't pride so much as love. Adeline wished she could look at someone the way that woman was looking at her cat hypnotist. Chapter 6 Colton was getting ready to leave the house when his phone rang. Seeing it was Gunner, he answered. You're up late. I need a favor. Gunner sounded rattled. Gunner never sounded rattled. What's up? Colton glanced at the clock. General Lee fell off her castle and I need you to take her to Happy Hoofs. Colton stood there dumbfounded. Had that sentence made any sense? Before he had any idea what Gunner was talking about, Gunner pushed, Can you? I'm sorry. What? General Lee broke her leg. I need you to take her to the vet. Oh. Happy Hooves was a vet, not a bar. The vet is open on New Year's Eve. That's why you have to take her all the way to Rapid. It's an emergency vet. Colton's stomach sank. Gunner, I'm sorry. I have plans. Had his brother lost his mind? This was livestock. You didn't rush livestock to a city vet in the middle of the night. It would probably cost him thousands of dollars. Please. Take your date with you. She'll think you're a hero. His words rang with desperation, and Colton's heart hurt for him no matter how ridiculous this was. But he couldn't take his date with him. He didn't even know if he had a date. And he doubted that the injured goat wanted to wait at the football field to see if she'd show up. Why couldn't Gunnar take her? Gunnar read his mind. I've got a goat giving birth right now, and she's struggling. I can't leave her. That's why you're on speakerphone. Would you rather come and assist in this goat delivery? If so, then I can take General to Rapid. Colton did not want to do any of these things. It hadn't been his idea to open a goat rescue. But this was Gunner, and Gunner would do anything for any of them. Colton sighed. Adeline probably wasn't going to show up anyway, and it was only 10 o'clock. Maybe he could get to Rapid and back, especially if he could just drop the goat off and drive away. How am I going to make decisions about what they do? What if it's some crazy price? He didn't want to accidentally euthanize Gunner's favorite goat, but he didn't want to put Gunner in debt either. Whatever they say, do it. This is General Lee. Colton bit back a laugh. Oh, of course. This was the special goat named after an orange car. Okay. If it needs surgery or whatever, can I just drop it off? I guess. You'll be able to text me. Just text me when you get there. Okay. Colton sighed. I'll be right there. Yeah. Gunner sounded surprised. Why do you sound so shocked? You called me. Did you really think I wouldn't do it? I had my doubts. And no offense, but you were the third person I called. Are you telling me that we have brothers with big plans tonight? Denver lived hundreds of miles away, but he didn't think any of his brothers had some big New Year's Eve party to get to. Not so long ago Cash would have, but Cash had changed, transforming into someone Colton hardly recognized. And the others, well, he was certain they were staying in tonight. Nobody will answer their phone. Colton chuckled on his way to the door. He couldn't blame them. He might not answer next time either. I'll be right there. Colton stopped being annoyed the second he saw the goat. The poor thing was obviously in pain. It lay there mostly listless beside Gunner who was tending to the most disgusting scene Colton had seen in a while. A baby goat stood on shaky legs beside its mother, who was bellowing and pushing her head against the wall. Is it supposed to look like that? She's struggling. I think she was bred by a goat much bigger than her. Gunner glanced down at the injured goat. Do you need help getting her to your truck? Colton wasn't excited about picking General up, but Gunner obviously had his hands full. I got it. He squatted to slide his arms under the goat, hoping the sawdust on the floor was as clean as it looked. Watch out for her horns. General Lee bleated weakly as he stood and then rested her head on his bicep. He was no goat shrink, 
but the gesture sure looked like gratitude. I'll text or call as soon as I know something. As he was walking away, he glanced at the suffering mama goat. Good luck with that. Gunner nodded, his jaw tense. Thanks, man. I owe you one. Colton carried the goat back out into the cold, and as the wind tried to blow the hat off his head, he hoped she wasn't too cold. What was happening? His brothers were turning him into a big softy. He laid the goat on its side on the front seat, but the seat wasn't wide enough to support its whole body, and he didn't want the injured leg to dangle off the edge. Hang on, buddy. He grabbed a cooler out of the club cab and a bunch of gym clothes. Then he built the goat a footrest. There. How is that? The goat didn't answer, of course, and he felt foolish talking to it. Sorry. We've got a long ride. He hustled around to his side of the truck and then got the engine started and blasted the heat. As he drove, he rested a hand on the goat's shoulder, petting it with his thumb. Sorry about the bumps. The road should smooth out soon. When he got back to town, he glanced at the clock. It wasn't even eleven yet, so there was no way Adeline would be at the field, right? Of course not. She wasn't even coming. Still, he drove half a mile out of the way, whispering an apology to General Lee, just to make sure that he wasn't missing Adeline. He didn't know what he was going to do if she was standing there. Was he really going to say, hey, it's great to see you? Isn't our little pact funny? Would you like to go to Rapid and visit Happy Hooves? He didn't have to worry about it. The parking lot was covered with a thin layer of unmarked snow. No one had been there for a while. Okay, General. Let's get you to where you're going. Chapter 7 Adeline was 30 minutes late getting to the football field. After the cat debacle, she still had to wait forever at the rental car booth. First, she couldn't find anyone to help her. Then when she found someone, he couldn't find a vehicle. Then when he found a vehicle, it didn't have any gas, and he had to fill it up. But finally she had gotten her car and sped east to West Hope. Her thoughts kept smashing into each other and bouncing around like rubber balls. What was she even doing? This was embarrassing, right? Even if Colton showed up, wasn't it embarrassing? She had left this town. She lived in a giant city. She was moderately attractive and had a great job. Why did she need to drive back to her hometown for a date with someone who is now a complete stranger? You're still single, an annoying voice whispered in her brain. It was true. The moderate attractiveness, the good job, the big city, none of that had found her love. Adeline's thoughts calmed a bit when she pulled into the high school parking lot. It was obvious that no one had been there for a long time. Snow fell softly on the giant flat space. It looked pristine. No tire or boot had touched it in hours. So, he wasn't here. Was he running late too, or was he not coming? It was silly to sit here and wait, but she didn't want to drive away if he was only running behind. Maybe he hadn't driven there. This thought was absurd. Why would he walk to the high school in the snow? But it was possible, and she couldn't see the field from where she sat. So she got out of the car and turned her collar up against the wind. She kept her head down as she walked to the field. When she stepped through the gate and looked up, she was glad that she had checked the field. There was no one there, and there wasn't a footprint in sight, but it was beautiful. The moon shone down through the snowflakes, making them look like crystals, the field looked big and pure and majestic, and part of her heart was transported right back to twelve years ago when she'd watched Colton Bridge run up and down the field like some kind of Greek god. Her eyes flitted to her spot in the bleachers, where the marching band had sat. She had played the tuba. She'd never really liked playing the tuba, had never really been good at it, and probably never should have picked it up in the first place. All the other girls had chosen the dainty little flute, but when the fifth graders were offered their choice of instruments, Colton had chosen the tuba, so she had as well. Less than a week later, Colton's father found out that he'd signed up for tuba lessons, freaked out, and said there was no way he was paying for a tuba rental. Colton had quit band, and she'd been stuck with the tuba. If she'd switched to the flute, people would have figured out why she'd chosen the tuba, and she couldn't let that happen. 
She didn't want Colton to know, and she didn't want to endure the teasing that would come from the rest of the class. Adeline took in a deep breath of West Hope air and smiled at the memories. This was nice, but it was time to go. She whispered, goodbye, to the part of her that still lived in those bleachers and then headed back to her rental car. She didn't want to go to her parents' house because she hadn't told them she was coming and because she knew they were sleeping, so she got a hotel room. It sounded like her next-door neighbors had opened a bar in their room, so she turned her TV up louder. She lay on her side, put her spare pillow over her exposed ear and tried to go to sleep. It didn't work. Instead of sleep, she lay there thinking about teenage innocence and teenage dreams. She and Colton had been silly to make a pact like they had, but had part of them been able to see into the future? Had part of them known that they would be single all these years later? You don't know that he's still single, that pesky voice in her head said. No, she didn't, and yet she kind of did. She would have heard about it if he'd committed to someone. Maybe even felt it. Chapter 8 Colton's heart jumped into his throat when he saw the tire tracks. Holy smokes, he said to the goat riding beside him, she actually showed up. Of course, he didn't really know that. Those tire tracks could belong to anyone. He pulled in beside them and stopped. Footprints stretched from the tire marks to the field. Snow landed softly in the impressions, slowly erasing them. He looked at General Lee. Do you mind if I leave you here for a minute? He jumped out of the truck and took a few steps, but then had second thoughts. General Lee had already peed on his seat once. Maybe he should let her out in case she planned to do it again. He went around the truck and opened the door. She started to jump out, but he caught her. He didn't think it was good for her to land on that leg. They'd shot her full of painkillers, and she was feeling much better, but he didn't want her to re-injure herself. He did not want to make another trip to Happy Hoofs. He set her down and tried to sound stern when he said, don't run off. He turned and walked into the wind, following the smaller footprints in front of him. He felt more than heard General Lee's presence and turned to see that she was trotting along merrily in his wake. She seemed to be perfectly happy as if she frequently accompanied strangers to empty football fields in the middle of the night. He sighed and turned back to the footprints in front of him. Somehow he knew they belonged to Adeline, and he couldn't believe it. She had really showed up. She had also left. A second set of footprints returned from the fields. Of course she had left. It was cold out, and he had stood her up. She wasn't going to spend the night standing beside a football field waiting for somebody who was mostly a stranger to her now. He desperately hoped that she figured he had forgotten. He didn't want her to think that he'd remembered but just blown her off. He didn't want her to think that he didn't care. He followed the tracks until they stopped at the fence near the 40-yard line. He stood in her footprints and looked around. This field had been his whole life. It was so weird now to think about it. He had never wanted to be one of those guys who peaked in high school and yet, it had happened. At least he wasn't one of the ones who sat at the bar every weekend and regaled the bartender with his high school stats. No, he had a life in the here and now, even if it wasn't an entirely satisfying one. He swallowed hard. Things would get better once he bought the gym. He would be a business owner. His income would triple. He'd be able to travel. Life would improve. Maybe it would even be as good as it had been back then, when he was leading the league in yardage. He turned and looked at the bleachers, where the awkward tuba player had once stood. Though he had never paid much attention back then, somehow, the memory was crystal clear, or maybe his brain was just filling in the holes with information that made sense. Either way, the image was a pleasant one. General Blatt, startling him a little. She was right, though. It was time to go. Come on, goat. He headed back to his truck with his head down, thinking about how he had wanted to play the tuba once, how his father had lost his mind. He'd been so angry that Colton had feared his fists. The man had never hit him, but the boys had always feared that someday he would start swinging. He shook the thoughts out of his head. No need to ruminate on his father. He didn't like to think about the man at all. He opened the door for General Lee and turned to see that she had fallen behind. 
hoping her leg wasn't hurting, he went back and scooped her up. He tried to get her to lie down in the front seat, but she wouldn't. She stood on all fours with her two front feet on the cooler. He gave up and shut the door. He needed to get this goat back to Gunner before it completely destroyed his truck. But on his way to the ranch, he found himself swinging by Adeline's parents' house. Of course, he had no idea what Adeline drove, so he wouldn't know whether she was there or not, but he did it anyway, only feeling a bit like a stalker. There were no lights on, and the garage door was shut with no tracks leading into it. She had not been there, and this surprised him. Maybe that hadn't been her at the field. Maybe someone else had decided to visit the high school football field on New Year's Eve. They had done it once, long ago. Of course, then there had been dozens of them. This person had gone solo. Of all the theories he could imagine that would explain those tracks, they were all ludicrous, including the one that Adeline Sharp had remembered a silly high school joke and then acted on that joke twelve years later. All the way to the ranch, Colton worked to convince himself that it hadn't been her, but he couldn't quite manage it. Chapter 9 Gunnar sat in an old bag chair watching the new mama feed her babies. He'd been up all night, but he wasn't tired. He was perfectly content to sit there and watch this miracle, this miracle that God had allowed him to participate in. An hour ago, he'd had to reach in and flip the second kid around. Despite all of his experience working with cattle, Gunnar had not felt equipped to do this, but some force beyond his understanding had told him when and what to do. And now all three babies were standing on their own, fighting over mama's teats. Looking at that dough, these kids were larger than they had any right to be, and Gunnar wondered about the buck that had done the deed. He would never know, of course. This goat had been dropped off along with two others a few months before. He hated it when people just dropped goats off, because it was so much more work to quarantine them when he didn't know anything about where they'd come from or how healthy they were. He was going to have to supplement these kids with a bottle, or they would wipe this dough right out. But that was okay. He wouldn't brag about it to anyone, but he liked having an excuse to snuggle the babies. In fact, right now, as the triplets fought over the two teats, the runt was consistently losing. Gunnar gently removed one of the winners to give the runt a chance, which he took immediately and greedily. Gunnar returned to his chair with the baby, who was still wet from birth. It felt so light and tiny in his arms. Let's give your brother a chance to eat, and then I'll put you back. He heard a truck pull into the driveway. It had to be Colton, but Gunnar did not get up to greet him. Thanks to funding from the Bannon Ranch, Gunnar had been able to heat this part of the barn, and he had no desire to go out into the cold. The door opened, and he looked up, surprised to see Colton carrying General Lee. Can she walk? Colton set her down in some straw. She sure can. She chased me all the way to the football field, he stopped talking and looked embarrassed. You took her to the football field? Colton's cheeks were red and Gunnar didn't know if he was embarrassed or if it was the wind. Why did you take her to the football field? There were more convenient places to give a goat a potty break. Colton stood there staring stupidly. Seriously, man you have to tell me. It's weird. Colton raised an eyebrow. I'm the weird one? You're the one up in the middle of the night cuddling a wet baby goat. Shut up. He was not going to admit that his brother had a point. Why did you go to the high school? Colton took a deep breath and looked at Gunner's chair. You got another one of those? Gunner pointed his chin at a folding stool. That's hardly the same thing. I live alone. I don't need two chairs. Colton picked up the stool and brought it over closer as General Lee suddenly noticed the baby in Gunner's lap, staggered a little, and then came in for sniff. Whoa, General Lee. He looked at Colton. Is she on drugs? Colton nodded. Yeah, I think she's feeling pretty good. There was no chance of me falling asleep at the wheel on the way home because she kept singing along with the radio. Gunner laughed. She's got some lungs on her. Thank you, by the way. If you hadn't helped, this doe might have died. So, why did you go to the high school? You're welcome. And you're paying for a detailing. She peed on my seat. Okay. Why did you go to the high school? 
I don't want to tell you. Stop pestering me. If you don't tell me, my imagination is going to come up with something worse than the truth. Colton narrowed his eyes. I'm not Cash. Gunner chuckled. I know you're not. You're a regular Dudley do right. That's why I'm so curious why you made some weird secret midnight pilgrimage to your high school. Is this something you do often? Definitely not. Colton took another deep breath, and Gunner wondered if he was going to have to beat it out of him. If you give me flack for this, I swear I'll never speak to you again. Since Colton had gone great stretches of time without speaking to him in the past, Gunner believed him. I won't poke fun. Now that I know that you're up for midnight goat rescues, I don't want to tick you off. Do you remember Adeline Sharp? Gunner thought hard, but no bells rang. No. She was in my class in school, and her family went to our church. We were sort of friends. We were at this weird party on New Year's Eve our senior year, and everybody was drinking, of course, and they decided to go throw the football around on the field. There was snow and everything, and it was freezing cold, but everyone was drunk, so nobody cared. Adeline didn't drink, so I'm stunned that she went along with this. Anyway, I got mad pretty fast because nobody would play right. They weren't following the rules. They were just being a bunch of pine cones, so I got mad, and I went and sat down. And then, I don't remember why or how, but eventually I ended up standing beside the fence, watching the idiots pretend to play football, and Adeline was there beside me. The metal bleachers were probably pretty cold on New Year's Eve. Colton nodded. That was probably it. Anyway, we got talking about how pathetic we were for being out there. Colton laughed at the memory, and Gunnar saw something weird spark in his eyes, something that made him think this memory was more precious than he'd originally thought. I don't know who said it first, but I remember that we both confessed how there is so much pressure on New Year's Eve. Pressure to have a date, pressure to kiss somebody at midnight. Did you kiss her? Gunnar interrupted. No, this all happened after midnight. I kissed Danielle. Where was Danielle while you're leaning on the fence with? What was her name? Adeline. And I don't remember where Danielle was. Gunnar chuckled. That was telling in and of itself. So, we were just talking about how hard New Year's Eve is, and she said something, I think, about how she couldn't wait to get out of West Hope so she could find a date, or something like that, and I remember saying something about Danielle. I can't remember what I said, but then Adeline said, let's make a promise. If we're not married by the time we're 30, we'll meet back here and marry each other. Was she drunk? She had to have been. If memory serves, she never drank. Then why did she say that? Colton shrugged. I don't know, but the weirdest part is that I agreed. I remember thinking that if things didn't work out with Danielle, then Adeline would be a great backup plan. Of course, I didn't think it would really happen. It never occurred to me back then when I was the main character of the universe that I would ever need help finding a woman at 30. Gunnar chuckled. It happens to the best of us. He was gaining on 40. Colton sighed. I guess it does. Anyway, she went away to college, and I lost track of her. In fact, I haven't thought about her in a really long time, but I'm 30 and this is New Year's Eve, so I was going to. Was this the plans you mentioned? Gunner guessed. Colton nodded, looking embarrassed. I didn't really think she would show up, but if she did, I didn't want to stand her up. I wouldn't have agreed to this goat mission, but I thought that I could get back before midnight. You're joking. What, had he planned to take a helicopter? Gunner thought about how quickly General Lee would faint in a helicopter and bit back a smile. He didn't want Colton to think he was laughing at him. I'm not joking. I thought I could just drop the goat off and run. I didn't realize I was going to have to sit there holding her head while they put a cast on her leg. He glared at General Lee. Don't act like you don't love her. Colton laughed. I don't love that goat. But you're right, I do like her more than I did when I left here. Anyway. So on your way back, you checked the field just to confirm that she didn't show up. And then, assuming that he was right and that she hadn't shown up, Gunnar added, sorry, man. She probably forgot all about it. 
Or maybe not. What? She was still there? Someone had been there. Someone with small feet. There were tire tracks, and then someone walked all the way to the fence. I mean, it might not have been her. I swung by her parents' house, and I didn't see any car there, so if she was at the field, then she didn't go there afterward. You drove my injured goat to the football field and then to this girl's parents' house? She wasn't in pain anymore. That goat is as high as a kite. Gunner glanced down at General Lee's eyes. She did look a little stoned. Where along the fence did the footprint stop? Colton furrowed his brow. What? He repeated the question slowly and then added, Did they end up near the spot where you guys made your little pact 12 years ago? Colton concentrated. Oh, wow. He looked at Gunner, startled. They did. Gunner shrugged. Then it was probably her. Then why didn't she go to her parents' house? How should I know? Would we have gone to our parents' house? No, but she had good parents. We had one good parent, Gunner said. That we did. Colton chuckled. And you know, as crazy as all this goat business is, mom would be so proud of you for all this foolishness. Gunner chuckled. He'd had that realization before. Sometimes I can feel her around here enjoying all the frolicking. Especially when the baby goats get playing. Is that why you built them a castle? Who said I built them a castle? You did. Well, sort of. You called me up out of the blue in the middle of the night and said that General Lee had fallen off a castle. I thought you'd lost your mind. I was picturing Bo and Luke Duke driving the car off some German castle. I did not build them a castle, but I did pay for the supplies. Riker built it. Riker? You got Riker to leave his house? Where have you been? Gunner said. What are you talking about? I've been at the gym. How did you get Riker to leave his house? Did you promise him that no one would be here except goats? No. I was here. So were Cash and Bella. And so was Riker's girlfriend. Colton almost fell off his stool. What, he cried. Riker has a girlfriend? Since when? She's new. Well, they've been friends a long time, but the girlfriend part is new. He even went to Las Vegas with her. Riker has been to Las Vegas? Gunner chuckled. You should talk to your brothers more. Anyway, his girlfriend, Frankie, was upset that my goats didn't have something to play on, so she ordered Riker to build them a playground. It doesn't really look like a castle, but it's so ridiculously big and involved that I started calling it that. He looked at Colton. So, what are you going to do? Gunner wasn't normally this invested in anyone's social life, but this was an intriguing story. The baby goat was looking at Colton too. They were both invested. Nothing. What is there to do? I missed my chance. Are you serious? That was her, man. Call her or send her a message or something. You can't just stand her up and then not say anything. Tell her you were saving a goat. She'll think you're a hero. Colton looked contemplative. Maybe. I don't have her number. I could message her on social media, but that's pretty lame. This whole thing is lame, but standing her up is way lamer than accidentally missing her and then never telling her why. Colton didn't say anything to that, but the silence gave Gunner another thought. Don't some of those apps tell you where she is? You're right. If she has her map turned on, he whipped out his phone, and Gunner stayed silent as Colton cyberstalked his old friend. Whoa. You were right. She's in West Hope. Message her in the morning. Take her out for breakfast. Bring her back here and show her some baby goats. It worked for Cash. What does that mean? Have you seen Cash's girlfriend? Colton nodded. I met her at Polly's dedication. Then you know she's gorgeous. The only way a woman like that would fall for Cash is because she fell in love with one of my goats first. Colton laughed. If you say so. Chapter 10 
After only two hours of sleep Adeline was awakened by a rooster. Only in West Hope, South Dakota, could one sleep at a hotel chain and be woken up by a rooster. She tried to fall back asleep, but it was to no avail, as the rooster kept telling the world how excited he was to be a rooster. She felt bad about coming to West Hope without telling her parents, but if she popped in, then they would want her to stay, and she didn't have time to stay. She had to get back to her life. She got herself together and checked out. She grabbed a free cup of coffee in the hotel lobby, but after one unfortunate sip, opted to dump the rest out into the snow. She went through a city brew drive through and by the time she pulled into the Rapid City Airport's rental car return lot, she felt almost human. She was still tired, but the coffee was doing its best. She dropped the keys off and then headed for TSA, grateful she didn't have a bag to check. She walked by food that made her mouth water, but she told herself that she could eat on the other side of security. The line was long. Lots of people were trying to get out of South Dakota today. To kill time, she checked her phone for updates and learned that her flight was delayed. Her stomach growled. Fine. She could eat on this side of security. She turned and headed toward the smell of fresh bread. The restaurant looked empty, but the hostess told her there would be a short wait to be seated. She took out her phone again, but she happened to look up when a man came bursting through the front door of the airport. Her heart recognized him before her eyes did, bringing her an odd elation that didn't immediately make sense. And then it did. That was Colton Bridge. And he was about to run right past her. He was giant. He was taller than she remembered and so, so rugged. In her line of work, she was frequently thrown into the air, so the first thing she thought of was that he would be able to throw her higher than she had ever been thrown before. It would feel like flying. He wore a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and his jeans fit better than any jeans had any right of fitting ever. Where was he going? As she stood there dumbfounded, he went around the corner out of view. She found her breath as the hostess told her that she could show her to her table now. Just a second. She stood watching the empty space that Colton had disappeared into even though she could feel the hostess's annoyance. Colton had carried no bags. But he had carried the frantic look of a person late for a flight. But where was he going without so much as a carry-on? Could he be there for her? Of course not. She tried to banish the thought from her mind. That was fantasy. Nowhere in the history of reality had a gorgeous cowboy chased a woman he barely knew into an airport to keep her from flying away from him. She should just accept the hostess's invitation and go eat her freshly baked bread like a normal single person. But she couldn't make her feet move. She couldn't steer her eyes away from that empty space. So she waited. Her patience was rewarded. He came back toward her, looking defeated. He wasn't hurrying anymore, and his head was down. He was about to pass within ten feet of her. Colton? He looked up and stopped, but it was clear he didn't recognize her. So maybe he wasn't there for her after all. This made sense. Still, it was cool to see him. She smiled. Adeline Sharp. His eyes widened. No way. He came toward her then with such purpose that she thought he really might pick her up and throw her into the air. She bent her knees in preparation, but he didn't throw her. What he did do was almost as strange and just as surprising. He wrapped his thick arms around her, pulled her into his chest, and then picked her up and spun her around. Her feet flew out behind her. There was no doubt about it. She had never been held, or spun, by a man this strong. When he stopped spinning and set her down, the world continued to spin around her, and she held onto his biceps to keep from flying off this fantastic new merry-go-round. Hi, she said, because she couldn't think of anything else to say. Hi, yourself. He smiled down at her, and she swallowed hard. He was easily the best-looking man she'd ever seen. He looked so much better at 30 than he ever had at 18. She had not seen that coming. I messaged you. He sounded a bit breathless. He did? Oh, sorry. My phone must be on silent. That's okay. I found you. He glanced up over her head at the restaurant sign. Were you going to get some breakfast? 
She nodded. My flight's delayed. Want some company? Adeline was embarrassed at how eagerly she said yes, but she couldn't help herself. She spun toward the hostess, who had now drifted away, but as soon as they made eye contact, Adeline smiled and held up two fingers. Two, please. The hostess looked annoyed, or maybe she was jealous. Colton was that good-looking. Right this way. She led them to a table that seemed too small for two people, but Adeline did not complain. She handed them a menu and left them. I am so, so sorry, Colton said. Adeline looked up. For what? I assume that you were at the field? His cheeks grew pink. Maybe I shouldn't assume that, but there were footprints, so I thought they were yours. He'd been there? She nodded, her mouth dry. This isn't even going to sound real, but do you remember my brother Gunner? Vaguely. She nodded again. Okay, so you probably didn't see this coming, but he's like running this massive goat rescue on my parents' ranch now, and he had a goat break its leg, and he needed me to take it to the emergency vet in Rapid, and I thought I could get to the vet and back to the field in time, but I couldn't. So I got there late, and I missed you, and I'm sorry. He laughed awkwardly, reminding her of the gangly freshman he'd once been. So, I've now driven to Rapid twice in less than 12 hours. It was a lot of information for her emotionally scrambled brain to process. So, you remembered, was all she could manage. I remembered. He stared at her for a moment before saying, you remembered. Yeah. The word wrote her exhale in a weird way, making it sound like she'd sung it. This embarrassed her, and she felt pressured to say something else. But you were late because you had to save a goat. He nodded. I'm not some goat-obsessed weirdo. That's my brother. I was just trying to help him out. Too bad. She kind of liked the goat-obsessed hero angle. So, here we are. We're 30. Happy birthday. She smiled. You already said that. He looked confused. She hurried to say, online. Understanding registered in his eyes. Oh, that. Yeah, that's not real. I mean, it's nice, that's why I do it, but it's not the same as a face-to-face, -face, so, happy birthday for real. Congratulations on 30. How were your 20s? He laughed. She was so nervous, and the fact that he didn't seem nervous at all made her more nervous. Honestly? My 20s were fantastic. Something that looked like pain flashed in his eyes, and then was gone. That's so great to hear. Tell me all about it. A server appeared and interrupted. They placed their order quickly even though neither of them had looked at the menu. It seemed both of them were in a hurry for the server to leave. Adeline found this encouraging. Was this really happening? Did Colton Bridge really want to spend time with her? Well, I graduated from UNLV with a major in dance. I floated around for a while doing small jobs through an agent, but then I got a really great job with a dance company. So, now I dance five nights a week on a big stage in front of a big audience in a big city. She shrugged. It's what I always dreamed of. I don't think I knew that. Knew what? That you were a dancer. Or if I did, I forgot about it. I was. I took lessons every week for 15 years, and then I went to college for dance. It's okay. Why would you remember that? It's not like we were best friends. I know, but we were friends. I'm sorry that I didn't know that. So you're like, he leaned back in his chair. A Vegas showgirl? His disbelief was loud and clear. She laughed. No. I can't imagine having to wear those costumes. Those headdresses alone can weigh 50 pounds. My neck would break. So then, what kind of dancing do you do? We put on big shows with lots of dancers, acrobats, props, all sorts of stuff. We'll do one show for several months and then do a new show. It's pretty cool. You should come sometime. I would love that. He gave her a look that she couldn't quite interpret but it was very serious. So, you live in Las Vegas. Chapter 11. 
Colton stared at the beautiful woman across the restaurant table and wanted to kick himself. He was butchering this. How was it even possible to be this awkward? He'd been so intent on finding her and apologizing that he hadn't given an ounce of thought to what happened next. Now he had no idea what to say to her. Was he supposed to propose? Ask her out on a date? Tell her not to worry about the pact, that he wouldn't hold her to it? This was insane. Las Vegas, he repeated and felt his cheeks grow warm. Okay, they had established that she lived in Las Vegas. They should stop saying the town over and over again. What's it like? It must be kind of crazy. She nodded. It is very crazy. It is also an awesome city. Beyond the Strip, which is where I perform, it's a great city. If I didn't work on the Strip, and I only lived in Las Vegas, I could probably live my entire life without going on the Strip. In the off-season, businesses there will have certain specials to try to attract the locals, but most of us still stay away. She shrugged. Of course, I can't, because the strip pays my bills. Why would you stay away from it? It's sort of like its own city within a city. I could compare it to the Vatican in Rome, but God probably wouldn't appreciate that. You can easily get around the city without ever driving through there, but to go through it or to get into it is a traffic nightmare. And then, once you're in there, it's just so loud and so busy, and I don't even mean busy with people, though it is, but I mean busy for the senses. Every noise is trying to outdo the noise beside it. The same goes for every light. And smell. Of course, the food is world-class top-notch. I mean, I haven't eaten everywhere in the world, but I can't imagine that there's food better than what's found on the strip. But still, I'm not sure it's worth going there to get it. She laughed. Sometimes I have it delivered, though. This was incredible. Adeline Sharp had been leading a really exciting life for the last 12 years. Also, when had she gotten this beautiful? Of course, there's also really great food off the strip, and that is usually more affordable. There is also lots of art culture. The music scene is good, and there are art shows and stuff. You probably wouldn't be into all that, though. Great. She thought he was a country bumpkin. Of course, he sort of was. He'd never been to Las Vegas. He'd never been anywhere. Part of him was furiously jealous that Riker had been to Las Vegas, and he hadn't. Anyway, it's just a really pretty city with nice people for the most part and a vibrant, lively culture. And I absolutely love the weather. She pretended to shiver, and it was adorable. No more South Dakota winters. Colton was so used to South Dakota winters that he hardly noticed them. They fell into an uncomfortable silence. Colton decided he might as well just come out with it. It wasn't going to get any less awkward the longer they didn't talk about it. So, about that pact. She giggled brightly. Yeah, about that pact. He forced a laugh, and he hoped it didn't sound as forced as it was. I'm not going to hold you to it. Her smile faded a little. Was that disappointment? Surely she hadn't thought they were really going to get married. But I was thinking, his brain scrambled to recover the fumble. He had no idea what to say next. Maybe we should at least go out on a friendly date, you know, to honor our innocent 18-year-old selves. As soon as he said the words, he realized how stupid they were. She was already at the airport. She couldn't go on a date with him. She was headed home. I mean, if you're already headed home, maybe we could do it some other time. I can change my flight, she said quickly. Her cheeks got pink, and she looked away. I have a few days off. He felt his smile widen uncontrollably and felt like a goofy teenager again. Really? He had no idea how he was going to entertain a Las Vegas girl in West Hope, South Dakota. Maybe he would have to take her to the goat farm after all. Great. Let's do it then. Tonight? Sure. You can pick me up at my parents' house. She started to give the address, but he interrupted her. I remember where it is. Her surprise embarrassed him, made him feel like a stalker. He shrugged. 
I think it's easier to remember things like that when you don't move away and fill your head with more interesting stuff. He almost growled at himself. He held up one hand. Not that your parents aren't interesting. Oh my word, could this get any worse? Not that they are. I mean, I don't drive by your parents' house all the time or anything. She started laughing. Of course you don't. And I don't know why I'm acting so surprised. I obviously remember where your parents live. Not anymore, he said before he could realize how much that would dampen the mood. Oh, did they move? They're both gone now. Her face fell drastically. Oh, Colton, I'm so sorry. Don't be. I mean, we were all pretty torn up about Ma dying, but life actually got easier when our father joined her. She scowled and looked surprised, and he felt like a heel for being so honest. Sorry, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but he was a real jerk, and we're all better off without him. Especially Gunner, who was stuck caring for him in the end. I'm still sorry. That's hard no matter what. Thanks. Let's talk about something else. Chapter 12 Adeline could see unmistakable sadness in Colton's eyes, and she was desperate to cheer him up. So, I have filled you in on my last decade. How about you? How were your roaring twenties? Before he could answer, their breakfast appeared. Adeline had forgotten she was hungry, but now that it was in front of her, she was ravenous. Not much to tell. I became a personal trainer, and I work at one of the only two gyms in West Hope. I'm pretty good at it. I have a waiting list to work with me. I help people of all ages get healthier and feel better about themselves. She was impressed by the pride in his voice. He really loved his work. That's so great. I work with a personal trainer too. She wished he was as much fun as Colton. You know, that kind of work probably pays a lot better in Las Vegas if you ever want to move. Of course, the cost of living is probably a smidge higher. He chuckled as he picked up a piece of bacon. You think? He took a bite and looked contemplative as he chewed. So that's pretty much it. Obviously, Danielle and I broke up a long time ago. She sort of went crazy. I've dated a few people, but nothing serious, and right now I'm trying to buy the gym that I work at. Her eyes widened. Really? That's so impressive. Maybe. I don't have it yet. But yes, I think I can do a better job with it than the current owner, no offense to him, but I've got big ideas about how to make it more attractive to all sorts of people. Right now, it's mostly people who are already in shape. I want to do some marketing to other people. He shrugged sheepishly. But for now, they're just ideas. Tell me about them. He looked confused. Your ideas. Tell me some of them. Oh. I'd like to add some classes that might appeal to different kinds of people. For example, right now the only class we offer is circuit training. I don't know any retired people or busy moms who are going to come for circuit training. I figured if we added some more relaxed, beginner-level activities, we might be able to get some new people in. And I would like to offer some childcare for a really low fee so that moms could come. That's so thoughtful. She was stunned by his innovation. I've done some research, seeing what other gyms are doing. We can't do it all, of course. I don't have a pool or anything, but I just think I could make it more user-friendly to West Hope. I'd also like to offer free membership to high school athletes, but when I suggested that to the current owner, I got laughed out of the gym. Why would you need to make it free? Aren't they already forced to go work out? They are, but most of them work out at the school, where the equipment is a joke. Some of it's not even safe. And there are so few athletes now. Sometimes the school can't even field the team. It might be wishful thinking to think that a gym membership as a benefit might entice some kids to play a sport, but I figure it's worth a shot. She had no idea that Colton was so thoughtful. She didn't remember that about him. Of course, she'd been so busy making googly eyes at him that maybe she hadn't listened to him talk. That's amazing. I hope you get to buy it. I hope so too. 
he focused on his breakfast, and she led him. They ate together in a comfortable silence broken only by the occasional mention of how good something was. She was pleasantly surprised by the food. Living in Las Vegas had made her incredibly picky, and she hadn't expected Rapid City Airport food to be tasty, but this was good stuff. She got a notification on her phone that her flight had been delayed again and was given an option to reschedule. She took it and grabbed the last possible flight that would get her back to Nevada in time for work. She was busy with her phone when the server brought the check, and Colton scooped it up before she could. She reached for it and ended up laying her hand over his. His skin was warm, and she had trouble pulling her hand away. You don't have to do that. I know, but please let me, or you will insult my manhood. She giggled. That wasn't something she heard in Las Vegas. Of course, in Las Vegas, no one ever offered to pay for her food. Well, I wouldn't want to insult your manhood, so thank you. That's very generous of you. You're welcome. Colton put his hand to the small of her back as they walked out of the airport. Can I walk you to your car? Oh, that's right. She was stranded. Actually, would you mind giving me a ride to my parents' house? I turned in my rental. His face fell, and he looked horrified. You don't have to, she hurried to say. I can rent another. No, no, it's not that I don't want to. It's just. What was going on? Was he embarrassed of his truck? She tried to think of a way that she could tell him that he didn't have to be, but she couldn't come up with anything. The truth is, he took a step back and put his hand on his hip. This is disgusting, but it's not my fault. My stupid brother's stupid goat peed on the passenger side seat, and it's so cold out that it hasn't fully dried yet. She laughed. It didn't make sense how endearing she found this new development. Do you have something in your truck we could put over the seat? He shook his head. I used all of that to prop her leg up. And now it's all in the wash. He ran a hand over his face. His frustration was adorable. Well, is it a bench seat? His eyes registered understanding. It is. Then I guess I'll just have to sit beside you. I will be the envy of every girl in West Hope. His cheeks grew pink, and he laughed. I doubt that. He put his hand on her back again, and her whole spine grew warm. Right this way. Adeline considered herself a sophisticated, professional woman with a full life and lots to be excited about, but nothing in her life could measure up to sitting in the middle of Colton Bridge's truck. She was sixteen and free as a bird again. A very, very happy bird. She wasn't close enough to touch him, but she could feel the heat off his body, and when they went over the speed bumps coming out of the Rapid City Airport, she was jostled into him, and the experience grew even more delightful. Thanks for pretending that you can't smell the goat pee. She giggled. You're welcome. She was tempted to loop her arm through his, but she didn't. But she was excited when they went around a corner that forced her to lean into him. I'm thinking I might kill my brother, he said. She laughed. Don't do that. Then you'd have to take over the goat rescue. Chapter 13 Colton only had one tool in his dating toolbox, dinner. It was the only one he'd ever needed, but he'd never been quite so eager, maybe even desperate, to impress a woman. Where in West Hope, or even the surrounding area, could he take a woman used to dining in Las Vegas? Nowhere, so he decided he wouldn't do dinner, that he would take her somewhere else, but where? There was nowhere to go in January in South Dakota. His brainstorming was going so poorly that he considered asking Tucker for help, but he didn't. Though Tucker was one of the least obnoxious brothers, he still didn't want Tucker to know how miserably he was failing at this. He also didn't want anyone to know how much he cared. Why couldn't they have scheduled their packed meetup for summertime when there was something to do in South Dakota? Everything was closed now. He could take her to a bar, but he wasn't much of a drinker. He could take her dancing, but he certainly wasn't much of a dancer. One of the local bars had a trivia night. He laughed aloud. That would be more embarrassing than the dancing. There was a rodeo at the fairgrounds, but it wouldn't start for another few weeks, and she would be long gone by then. 
Besides, he didn't want to wait two weeks to spend time with her. He didn't think he was falling in love or anything, but he really wanted to maximize this opportunity to hang out with a beautiful, fun woman from the big city. Maybe dinner was his only option. He did an internet search for best restaurants in Rapid City and got a list of diners with lots of stars. He shook his head and tried fine dining in Rapid City. Then he clicked on the result with the most dollar signs beside it. Wait. This one might actually work. The restaurant was on a rooftop, offering views of the city and the countryside beyond. Then he remembered that it was still January, and he very much doubted they were seating people on the roof tonight. He groaned. They could try it anyway. It still looked like fancy food. Of course, he was no expert, but he thought small portions arranged in weird ways on the plate was an indicator of quality. But when he called for a reservation, they were all booked up. He couldn't believe it. All booked up and rapid? He went back to his results and picked another restaurant with multiple dollar signs. This one was a steakhouse. No surprise there. But they had a table available. Now he had to figure out what to wear. In his lifetime, he'd only ever owned a few nice outfits, and he had bulked up enough to make them all too tight. He was a little embarrassed. A grown man should own a pair of slacks, but he went with jeans instead and his best pair of boots. His only halfway decent button-up shirt was a short sleeve, which was a little silly when it was five degrees outside, but he put it on anyway. Then, he took his best hat out of the box. He never wore it. It had been an impulse purchase years ago. He'd felt guilty about it since then, but now he was glad for his short lapse in self-control. There. He looked in the mirror. He wasn't entirely pleased with what was looking back at him, but he didn't think he could improve on it any, short of time travel. When he picked Adeline up at her parents' house, his first thought was how had she known to bring a dress. He complimented her, and when she spun around, he saw that it still had a tag on it, and he chuckled softly. Here, let me get that for you. With both hands, he gently plucked the tag from the fabric, careful not to rip anything. His knuckles brushed against the back of her arm, and he could have sworn that she shivered a little. Do you have a coat? She held up her hand to show him her outerwear, and her cheeks were pink. Was she embarrassed of the tag or the shiver? Great. He told her again how good she looked, and she joked about how she had planned to take the dress back once their evening was over. He laughed harder than the joke merited, and it was his turn to be embarrassed. He was acting like Carissa. He hurried ahead to get the truck door for her and then offered her a hand that he was sure she didn't need. Her leg muscles were the most toned he'd seen in a very long time, and he wondered how much she could leg press. Just this thought made his cheeks even warmer, and he shut the door in a hurry. When he slid behind the wheel, she asked him where they were going. He told her, and she said she hadn't been there before. Of course she hadn't. She'd been gone for more than a decade. Do you like steak? Not really. Fantastic. Well, he put the truck in reverse to back out of the driveway. Let's hope they have something else on the menu. Actually, when in Rome and all that. I think I'll have a big steak. Do they monitor your diet much? Heat rushed to his face as he panicked that she might think he was suggesting she was overweight, which she absolutely was not. He hurried to add, I mean, with the professional dance team or whatever, I just wondered if they tried to optimize your diet. They do not. I'm sure if I had any trouble they would find me some help, and when I first was getting started, I had an agent who was nosy about that kind of stuff, but for the most part they trust us. Honestly, if we ate junk, we wouldn't be able to keep up, not because of weight gain or anything but just because of energy levels. I have to eat a lot to dance as much as I do, but it's mostly fruit and vegetables. He could feel her eyes on him. But I don't have to dance tomorrow, so tonight, steak. Colton didn't say anything, but he didn't really love steak either. At least they had something in common. He hoped that wasn't the only thing. He didn't know how he was going to build a relationship around a lack of beef passion. Chapter 14 over and over Adeline begged herself to calm down. This wasn't necessarily the next big thing in her life, this was only dinner with an old friend. 
So why was she so nervous? And why couldn't she stop herself from stealing glances at him? Had he worn a cowboy hat much back in high school? She didn't think so. Of course, she'd mostly seen him in class, in the school hallways, and on the football field, so he wouldn't have had many opportunities to wear a Stetson. Maybe that was a good thing because it was doing some real damage now. A perky hostess sat them at a small table for two in the corner of the small, dimly lit restaurant. Two candles burned in the center of the table, and she wondered why one hadn't been enough. The double dose turned out to be fortuitous though. The small, flickering flames reflected in his eyes as he returned her stare. Finally, he broke his gaze to consult his menu, and she pretended to consult hers. He didn't think for long. When he ordered his food, she smiled at the server and said, I'll have the same. His jolt of surprise was unmistakable, making Adeline wonder what she'd missed. Colton raised an eyebrow. The porterhouse? Despite growing up in these parts, she had no idea what that meant, but context told her she'd ordered a large hunk of meat. I like to have leftovers. He smiled, looking oddly impressed. I'm guessing that you will. Why was he shaming her steak choice? So, tell me about this career of yours, he said, looking at her expectantly. She was happy to talk about herself, but as she told him about her parts and the shows and the audiences, a weird expression grew on his face. She couldn't quite read it, but it wasn't good. Was he annoyed? Did he think she was being arrogant? Don't get me wrong, she said. I'm grateful to God for all of it. I know that I'm very blessed. I won't argue with you, but I've noticed that God often blesses those who work hard. In fact, I've noticed that often the harder one works, the more they're blessed. Has that happened for you? You've always been a hard worker. He chewed his bottom lip and looked away, and she regretted her question. Maybe it hadn't worked for him. Yes, and no. I picked an odd line of work, and yes, I've worked hard at it, but it's still an odd line of work. How so? Making health into a way to earn a living depends upon people wanting to be healthy, wanting to get healthy, and then stay that way. So, I worked my tail off to learn about health and to get myself in shape, but I'm still dependent on how many people around me want what I can offer. I haven't yet figured out how to make them want it. So far, that part's been up to them. I wonder if it's because you're offering it here. She looked around. Actually, here in Rapid might be better than West Hope. You said there are two gyms there? Right. And how many personal trainers are in each gym? Three in ours. I'm not sure about the other place, but I'm guessing three or four. I bet there's a lot more here in Rapid. He didn't look convinced. And even more in a bigger city. She couldn't imagine how many personal trainers there were in Las Vegas. I hope you're not trying to talk me into moving to the city. Why not? Don't tell me that you're one of those people who thinks all cities are evil. He chuckled. Not evil, necessarily. Just scary. That surprised her, and she didn't know if he was kidding. Why, Colton Bridge, I always thought you weren't scared of anything. He guffawed. Hardly. I don't mean literally. I think I can walk down a city street without shaking in my boots, but I don't think that I'd ever be comfortable living in one. It's just so busy. So loud. My brother Denver does it, but he's a nut. She laughed. Oh, that's right. I forgot you had a famous brother. He looked skeptical. It was true, though. She hadn't thought much about the famous Cyan Denver because she'd been too busy thinking about Colton. Why did they change his name, anyway? I'm embarrassed how long it took me to figure out that it was the same guy. I kept thinking that actor in Cheyenne looked so familiar. The name Denver Bridge sounds like a bridge in Denver. Just like Cash Bridge sounds like a toll bridge. Colton nodded. In the name department I guess I lucked out. So are you a Cheyenne fan? She shook her head. No, I can't say I've watched much of it. Sorry. Don't say sorry to me. I have no skin in that game. Still. You must be proud of your brother. He looked contemplative. 
Honestly, it's never occurred to me to be proud of Denver. Sometimes it doesn't even feel like we're related. That's sad. He looked defensive. Sorry, I didn't mean to judge. Family is complicated. But you get along with your other brothers? Not really. He laughed. Gunner's good. And weirdly, Cash has gotten better lately. I guess he's finally growing up. But the rest of them. What about Riker? I heard about his accident. How is his recovery going? I don't know much about it, Colton admitted. Though he started dating again, so I guess that's good. And I hear he's going to church now too. Our old church? He nodded. My parents still go there. Sorry, I wouldn't know. I haven't gone in a very long time. You should. He gave her a look that was hard to read. Maybe I will. Do you go to church in Vegas? She nodded. I sure do. No place better to go to church than Sin City. She took a drink of her water. They fell into an awkward silence that she wanted to break. Want to know something funny about our old church? Sure. I absolutely hated youth group. Huh? Yeah. I only went because you went. A smile crept onto his lips. Really? Yeah. It was so lame. But you were there, so, yeah. The awkward silence returned. So about that pact, she started. No use pretending that wasn't why they were there. What about it? You said you weren't going to hold me to it, and I won't hold you to it either. You officially don't have to marry me. He didn't smile. Okay. She wasn't sure how to interpret that. But I think it's sad that we lost touch. We should at least be friends. Okay. He shifted in his chair, obviously uncomfortable. So tell me more about Las Vegas. She didn't want to tell him more. Every time she talked about herself, he seemed unhappy to hear it. I'm tired of talking about myself. This wasn't entirely true. Tell me more about you. He sighed. There's not much to tell. You're the one who's a big deal. And there it was again. Colton, I'm sorry, but are you irritated with what I do for a living? He shook his head quickly. Of course not. I'm sorry if I made you think that. I guess. The server brought fresh bread and warmed butter and, though it smelled and looked miraculous, Adeline was more interested in what Colton was thinking. As soon as the server walked away, she prodded him. It might be hard to believe now because I was so cocky last time you saw me, but I'm not so cocky anymore. You're just so great, I guess it makes me feel a little bad about myself. I'm sorry. I would never take anything away from you. It's not your fault. She didn't know what to say to that, but she was desperate to make him feel better, to see how awesome he was. Colton, you have a career that you love. You're not doing some job that you hate. You're doing something that helps people. And you're healthy and you're gorgeous and you have a stable income, he was grinning foolishly. What? Did you just say I was gorgeous? She rolled her eyes. Don't let it go to your head. And you've always been gorgeous. But Colton, I'm in no way better than you. For crying out loud, we are cut from the exact same bolt of cloth. I'm not sure that's true. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yes, okay, I dance in Las Vegas for a living, but I grew up in West Hope just like you. We went to the same schools. Had the same teachers. Knew the same people. Same bolt of cloth. You can have more than one kind of fabric made by the same, he scowled. What's that thing called where the threads go like this? He thatched his fingers together. She giggled. A loom? Yes, a loom. So I am cotton, and your silk, made on the same loom. I'm not sure silk is made on the loom, but whatever. She reached for the bread. You always knew you were getting out of West Hope, he said. Don't pretend otherwise. So did you. She instantly regretted her words. I mean, you were supposed to leave. 
For the first time, she wondered what had happened. Last she'd known, he was NCAA bound. Why didn't you go? Surely you were good enough to play in college. He nodded. I was, but I wasn't good enough for a full scholarship, and my father was not about to pay for college. You could have gotten financial aid. He shook his head. Not much. That man owned a lot of land. I'm sorry, Colton. She hadn't really thought about that, about why his football career hadn't continued. I thought about taking out loans myself, but both my parents convinced me that debt was shameful. He shrugged. So here I sit. I was very blessed to have parents who would pay for college, she said softly. I'm sorry it didn't go that way for you. She could feel the sadness coming off him in waves. She reached across the table and squeezed his hand. Hey, growing up, I always wanted to be a dancer, and people would tell me that it was an unrealistic dream. So they told me I had to have a backup plan. You want to know what my backup plan was? He studied her. I can't begin to guess, but whatever it was, it's making your eyes dance right now. Donkeys. He laughed. What? Yes. I always wanted to own donkeys. I told people I would be a donkey farmer or a donkey trainer. He laughed. I don't think either of those things is a thing. I know that now. That's why I had to become a dancer, because there was no future in my donkeys. He was still laughing, and it made her feel so much better. Have you ever even owned a donkey? She shook her head and took a bite of her bread. It's too bad you weren't around for the midnight goat rescue. Maybe that would have fulfilled part of your dream. Goats aren't donkeys, she said, her mouth full of good bread and even better butter. I know that, but I didn't have a broken-legged donkey to rescue. It was her turn to laugh. I would like to visit your brother's goat ranch sometime. He rolled his eyes. Be careful what you wish for. No, really. Will you take me? He didn't think about it for long. Actually, I have to go over there tomorrow to talk about selling my part of the land. I don't think it's going to be much fun, but if you'd like to come along, there will certainly be goats there. It was the most enticing invitation she'd heard in years. Chapter 15 Colton had never been so eager to give someone a good night kiss, but he was struggling to read the situation. She was the one who had brought up the pact again. She'd blown it off as a joke, as kids play, and she'd said that they should be friends. So, she didn't want him to kiss her, correct? But the way she was looking at him suggested otherwise. He wasn't even sure if he should get out of the truck and walk her to the door because then there was all this additional pressure to kiss her. Plus it was her parents' house. He really didn't want to get shot by her dad. Did dad still shoot 30-year-old men for kissing their 30-year-old daughters on their front porch? Yes, Colton thought they might because it was still their front porch. And she was still his daughter. The house was dark, though it wasn't that late. Do your parents go to bed early? I'm not sure. It looks that way, doesn't it? She sounded nervous. What did that mean? Why did girls have to be so hard? He put the truck in park and sat there stupidly. With the wind chill, it was probably 20 below zero outside. So he was kind of a jerk if he didn't get out and walk her to the door, right? But was it presumptuous to do so? Was this even a real date? He wanted to. Um. On the side of caution, but he did not know where caution sat right now. His hands and limbs made the decision for him and got out of the truck as if out of habit. He tried to get around the front of the truck in time to open the door for her, but she didn't wait. He walked beside her to the front door in a state of panic. Should he hug her? Kiss her? Shake her hand? He stepped up onto the porch. They both said thank you at the same time, their words colliding awkwardly between them. She giggled. Thank you, she said again. I had a great time. We should have done this sooner. He didn't know how to interpret that. He wished he hadn't wasted all that time on Danielle. He wished that he'd bought Adeline a porterhouse when they were 17. Of course, he couldn't afford a McDonald's hamburger back then. You're welcome. 
His voice came out squeaky, and he was embarrassed. So, we're still on for tomorrow? The goat visit? He nodded. Sure, but if you come to your senses and back out before then, that will be fine. She looked concerned. And it's okay, if I go? Your brothers won't think that's weird? They probably will think that's weird, but I don't care what they think. Gunnar will be happy that someone's there to visit the goats. He'll probably try to send you home with one. She tittered. I would be tempted to take one, but I don't think that a goat would fit in my apartment back home. He winced at her use of the words back home. Those words sounded like they should refer to West Hope, but that's not how she had used them. Her home was in Las Vegas, hundreds of miles away. And the miles were sort of moot, Las Vegas was worlds away. Okay, pick me up? Absurdly, he thought she was asking him to pick her up off her feet and almost reach for her, but then he came to his senses. Oh. Yeah. I'll pick you up tomorrow. She laughed again, but then her laugh ended abruptly as she looked at him with wide eyes. She didn't move, she didn't even breathe. She just looked at him. There were only a few feet between them. This was it. She would not just be standing there unless she wanted him to do something, right? He reached one hand up to take off his hat. He was going to go for it. But before he could even grab the crown, she was on her tiptoes. She laid one hand on his shoulder and then her feather-soft lips were pressed against his. They were cold from the outside air, but they warmed quickly, and he leaned in for more of her, but then she pulled away, smiling. I wanted to do that so much when I was seventeen. Well, also when I was sixteen. And fifteen. Her voice grew softer as she spoke. So did his knees. She smiled and caressed his cheek. Better late than never, right? She winked. I'll see you tomorrow. She went inside, leaving him stupefied on that dangerous front porch. He forced his legs back toward the truck, and though he wanted to sit there and ponder the questions of the universe, he didn't want her father to see that happening and change his mind about shooting him, so he avoided deep thought until he was outside of town. Then he allowed himself to reimagine that kiss. What a doozy it had been. But what she'd said afterward had left him rattled. She had wanted to kiss him when she was in high school. So that's why she'd done it? Was that the only reason why? Was that some weird gesture in honor of her teenage self? It had been a short kiss, too short. Maybe she hadn't meant it. Maybe it had nothing to do with the present. He sighed. He wasn't sure he was going to get much sleep tonight. Chapter 16 Adeline shut her parents' front door and turned and leaned against it. She held her breath, listening for his footsteps. It took him a second, but he got moving, and she listened to him walk away before exhaling dramatically. She couldn't believe she'd done that. It was so out of character, but what she had said was true. She'd been wanting to do that for a very long time, and though she had sort of forgotten about Colton over the years, seeing him again had brought those desires rushing back as if no time had passed. And those desires had emboldened her. It was almost as if she'd let him go once, so she was never going to let him go again, at least not without a kiss. And what a humdinger of a kiss that had been. She'd been kissed before. She knew when a man was into it. And after the initial shock, Colton Bridge had been into it. I saw that. Adeline let out a shriek and looked up to see her mother standing in the dark kitchen. What are you doing? Spying. You scared me half to death. Are you sure that's the best idea, kissing that boy? Mom, he's not a boy anymore, and yes, trust me, that was a very good idea. Is that why you're back here for the surprise visit? To see him? There was no use lying. Something like that, yes. She carried her porterhouse toward the fridge, flicking on the light on her way by. Her mom threw her hand up to her eyes. Ah! She cried as if she'd never seen light before. Why are you sneaking around in the dark in your bathrobe? Because I didn't want you to know that I was spying? Why are you spying? I'm 30 years old. I know, honey. I wasn't spying because I thought you needed my help. 
I was spying because I was bored. I know it seems like I'm living every retired woman's dream around here, but that's not always the case. I'm sorry, mom. She shook her head. Oh, don't be sorry. The Lord is good. I like a peaceful life. But if given the chance to spy on my daughter's exciting life, I'm going to take it. So, that was Colton Bridge? Adeline nodded as she filled the tea kettle with water from the faucet. I knew his daddy. I know, mom. She'd heard this speech a long time ago. More than once. I'm not sure he's someone you want to be kissing. Adeline sighed. He's 30 years old now, mom. I think he turned out okay. Not everyone turns into their parents. Thank goodness for that. She sat at the table. Make me a cup of tea, would you? Adeline had already planned to. So, what's the future in this? Honestly, I don't know if there is any, but I'm not even thinking about that. I just like spending time with him, and I had a chance to kiss him, so I took it. That's the most gorgeous man I've ever kissed. I hope you haven't been kissing lots of men, her mother said. I have not. You don't need to worry about that. Just don't go getting your heart all busted up. You have a dream career far away from here. I know, but who says he can't move to Las Vegas? Her mother snorted. Is that on the table? I don't know. I think pretty much anything is on the table at this point. He doesn't have any kids? If he does, he hasn't mentioned them yet. Of course, if he were going to buy the gym that he was talking about buying, that would throw a wrench in her plans. Maybe she should talk him into Vegas before he bought a business in South Dakota. She leaned against the counter to wait for the water to boil. He's almost as good-looking as his brother. Adeline knew that she meant Denver. Her mother was a big Cheyenne fan. I think he's better looking. Her mother rolled her eyes and scoffed, oh, for heaven's sake, as if Zion Denver were the most gorgeous man on the planet. The water was taking so long that Adeline regretted starting the project. She wasn't tired, but she was becoming annoyed with her precious mother. If this were a romance novel, you would quit your career and move home to the small town to marry the cowboy and have his babies. I hope that's not where this is headed. Adeline sighed. You read too many romance novels. No such thing, her mother said quickly. I'm not quitting anything, but I can tell you that there are no old lady dancers in our company, and my knees aren't going to last forever no matter how much physical therapy I do. But don't worry, I have no intentions of giving up my career for a man, even a man as wonderful as Colton. She looked out the window into the darkness. Her mother was right. Maybe this was a wild goose chase. Or maybe it was time to start looking into donkey training. Chapter 17 It had seemed like such a good idea at the time, but now that Colton was carrying his bag of surprises into the restaurant, he wondered if he'd made an error in judgment. He had offered to give Adeline a ride, but she'd said she would point her morning run toward the small diner. He couldn't imagine himself running and then seeing her. He would be beat red and awash with sweat, but when he saw her, she looked great. No evidence of her workout except a slight pink tint to her upper cheeks. Her hair was up in a perky ponytail, and she wore workout clothes that looked brand new. She smiled brightly when she saw him. You look awfully good for someone who just ran two miles. It helps that it's ten degrees outside. It's hard to sweat in the Arctic. He laughed and signaled to the server for coffee. Do you run outside in Vegas? She nodded. I do, and this morning I really missed it. It felt like someone was stabbing me in the lungs with icicles. She laughed at her own joke and picked up the menu. I will let you drive me home, though, if you don't mind. I don't want to run after bacon and coffee. Oh no. Was she bailing on her trip to the ranch? He could understand the decision, of course, but he was still disappointed. What is it? She was staring at him. I thought we were going out to the ranch to see the goats. Oh, we are. But that's right now? She looked down at her clothes. I guess I thought I would get a small break to make myself look presentable. You look great. 
Right, you say that because you're nice. He wasn't as nice as she thought he was. But I don't want your brothers to judge me. My brothers are too self-involved to judge anyone. Well, not Denver, but he won't be there. She didn't look disappointed to hear that Denver wouldn't be at the family reunion, and this made him happy. He liked that she wasn't all starstruck by his Hollywood brother. She leaned over to eye the bag beside his chair. What you got there? Taking some books back to the library? He chuckled. Hardly. It was now or never. If this was going to be embarrassing, he would survive it. He reached into the bag and pulled out the freshman yearbook, though the senior one was the most entertaining. He handed it across the table to her. You didn't write much in this one, but I thought we should go in order. She took it, looking amused. Actually, I just took this walk down memory lane myself back home. There was that back home phrase again. He wished it didn't cause him pain to hear it. Oh, he held his hand out for the yearbook. Never mind, then. She yanked it out of his reach and laughed playfully. I didn't say that I didn't want to look at it. Did I sign this one? He nodded. Just a signature, though. You were playing hard to get. He winced. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. But she was still smiling. It's okay. I knew you were kidding. Her eyes looked up at him while her face stayed pointed at the yearbook. Are the other women you hang around that offendable? I don't hang around a lot of women, and yes. She laughed. I don't think I'm arrogant, but I'm confident enough that I'm pretty hard to offend. Good to hear. Though he didn't know what confidence had to do with offendability. She sat up straighter and pretended to peek into the bag. How about sophomore year? Did I write anything? A little. You made some inside joke that I can't remember. She rolled her eyes. Oh boy. You probably didn't get it then either. She held her hand out, and he obliged. She flipped the yearbook open and asked him where to look. Band page. She visibly winced, which he found charming. Don't be embarrassed of your band time. I think it's cute. I don't think you thought it was cute back then. He honestly couldn't remember, but she was probably right. He would probably have been more impressed by the cheerleaders, but he couldn't remember ever looking at a girl other than Danielle. She groaned. What is it? It's so lame. He couldn't believe how excited he was to have it explained to him. I was lame enough to bring high school yearbooks to breakfast, so you can be lame enough to explain our private joke. She shook her head. I don't think it was a private joke. She looked up at him and tilted her head. During one of your games, I played a really discordant note really loudly. You looked right at me, and then the next day you made fun of me for it. His heart sank. I did? I'm so sorry. Again, back then, I don't think I was offended. I was so excited to have attention from you that I thought it was hilarious. So I made a joke about how I would play wrong notes just to get your attention. Really? None of this sounded even vaguely familiar. I remember being on that football field and I'm finding it very hard to believe that I would have noticed a wrong note. I'm not exactly musical. You know, that could have been the case. I'm the one who brought it up the next day, so maybe it was just a coincidence that you happened to look up just then. He didn't know what to say. Sorry, I guess I don't remember as much about high school as I thought I did. She waved away his apology. I think we all remember like 1%, and it's in still shots. Maybe a few short video segments. I would never expect you to remember that. You probably forgot it by the next week. She said all this without sounding sad, but it made him sad. She had actually worked to get his attention? And he hadn't given it to her. Of course, he'd been in love with Danielle, which was so embarrassing and Adeline had been the smart band girl. But he still regretted how things had gone. The server arrived to take their order, and Adeline talked really fast and then asked for the junior yearbook. You didn't sign that one. Something like pain flickered across her face. Oh. That makes sense. How so? 
You and Danielle were really a solid item by then. Maybe I didn't have a chance to sign your yearbook. She was probably the one in charge of gathering signatures. He found that hard to believe, but he flipped through and sure enough, there weren't any female signatures. Oh my gosh. Was she really that bad? He looked up to see Adeline shaking her head. She was so much worse. He couldn't help but laugh, though the news was painful. I wish I'd seen it. I wasted a lot of time and pain on her. I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm really glad that you didn't marry her. He laughed. Me too. She's on her third husband now, I think. Adeline sucked in some air. Oh wow. That sounds complicated. He laughed. It is. She even went to jail for a while. I think that's when she lost husband number two. He didn't like thinking about it, so he handed her the senior yearbook as a way of changing the subject. Here's where it gets good. She waited for him to tell her where to flip, and he told her to go to the back. She gasped theatrically. It's like a whole page. Don't exaggerate. It's only three quarters. She laughed. Yet no one filled up the space below. Her tone suggested she couldn't quite believe what she was seeing. Do you remember writing any of that? She shook her head. Thank goodness I do not, and I'm a little mad at you for making me aware of it now. The laughter that followed told him she wasn't really angry. This is so embarrassing. I want to stop reading, but I can't make myself. He had already read it, though he didn't remember reading it back then. If he had, it hadn't meant as much as it meant to him as he read it this morning. She surprised him when she started to read it out loud. Colton, it's been such a long, strange trip. She looked up and giggled. It wasn't long. And now that I live in Las Vegas, I know that nothing about it was strange. Her eyes were dancing again. She returned her focus to the page. I don't think you have any idea how much you mean to me, and maybe you never will. But since this is my last chance to tell you, I'll give it a shot. Colton, you are so much better than you think you are. You think you're just a football star, but you're so much more than that. You are a complete person, so much smarter than anyone gives you credit for and so much more sensitive than you give yourself credit for. She looked up again, and her eyes were shiny with tears. Well, I guess I was pretty deep for an 18-year-old. He nodded. He did remember that part. She kept reading, I wish that I could show you how awesome you really are, but I don't know how. I hope you figure it out soon. I hope that being a college football star doesn't just reinforce your belief that a stupid ball is all you are good for. His stomach rolled. He had known by then that he wasn't going to be playing football in college, but he had still let everyone believe it. She was staring at him. I'm really sorry I called your ball stupid. He laughed. I forgive you. She went back to the page. I am off to UNLV, but that doesn't mean that I can't still be part of your life. I'm your biggest fan, Colton, and I don't even know any of your football stats. I'm also probably your best friend, though you might not know it. So, please know that I'm always here for you. I'm serious. Anything you need, you can call anytime. She laughed suddenly and looked up at him. That's nuts. What if you turned into a criminal? I'm basically inviting you to call me for bail money. Good thing I didn't turn out to be a criminal. He smiled to let her know he wasn't offended by her imagination. She looked at the page again. I underlined serious four times. Good grief. I don't even know what to make of this. It's so over the top. I think it was just high school. All feelings were so strong then. Even if they didn't make sense, they were all consuming. She looked up. See, there's that sensitivity I was talking about. You pretended to just be a dumb jock, but you never really were. If that was true, he had never known it. He had always felt exactly like a dumb jock. Oh boy, it gets worse. Listen to this. I would wish you the best with Danielle, but she is not good enough for you, so I hope you find someone better. 
I hope you find the career of your dreams, and I hope you find true happiness, and I hope I get to be your friend. Don't forget about our pact. If things get really bad, I'll see you on New Year's Eve. She looked up, and her eyes were wider than he'd ever seen them. I have never been this embarrassed in my life. He laughed. Please don't be. I thought it was cute. I never would have shown you if I thought you were going to be embarrassed. If things get really bad? Why did I write that? Things are not really bad, and I still showed up and so did you. Things aren't really bad in your life either. I think back then we thought that being single was a really bad thing. She nodded thoughtfully. Well, it kind of was. Even if it was healthy, there was a stigma attached to it. Good for her that she was saying all this in past tense. He still found it pretty awful to be alone, and he thought there was still a stigma attached to it. Chapter 18 Adeline climbed into Colton's truck, glad breakfast was over. She wasn't mad at him for bringing the yearbooks, but that had been brutal. She wished she could talk to her 18-year-old self and tell her to never touch a pen again. But Colton didn't seem nearly as phased by it as she was. Maybe she was embarrassed because she could remember the intensity of the feelings she'd had back then. She didn't remember writing the message, but every word rang true. She remembered that burning fire in her heart and that frustration with how he wasn't living up to his potential. It was a short ride out to his parents' ranch, and she enjoyed the views. They were nothing special, not really, but it had been a long time since she'd seen the forest slowly giving way to the rolling prairies. She really loved her home state. She was grateful to live in a big, exciting city, but there was nothing quite like South Dakota. It was still home in so many ways. So your brother Gunner is still running the cattle ranch? He is. He works his tail off. I don't know how well he's doing financially, but I guess he's able to stay afloat. Was your dad financially successful back in the day? More so than Gunner, I think, but we were never rich. He shrugged and tightened his grip on the top of the steering wheel. Of course, if we were, I probably never would have known. I never knew my father to have any extra money, but if he did have it, I know him well enough to know he probably would have hidden it in a box in the barn. She laughed even though it wasn't funny. I'm sorry he wasn't an ideal father. Me too, but I survived. We all survived. In fact, there was a time when I thought Cash, being the youngest, might have been so damaged that he would never recover, but it seems that that is not the case. He's got a daughter now, and an awesome girlfriend who I think he's going to marry soon. He's got a great job. He paused. Yeah, so I guess the Bridge brothers are all going to be okay, no matter how hard our father worked to make that not the case. Adeline's heart broke for him. Back then, she hadn't known how difficult Colton's home life was. Maybe that was a good thing. She might have tried to kidnap him. He pulled up the long driveway that led to the old ranch house and barn. She'd been here a few times in high school, but she didn't think she'd ever been inside. She looked down at her gym clothes. I really wish I was wearing nicer clothes. At least they were new. Please don't worry about it. No one's going to notice. She got out of the truck and also wished she was wearing a coat. Colton opened the front door without knocking and let her go in first, and her stomach was attacked by nerves. Why was this such a big deal? She didn't understand why she was so anxious. A woman sat on the couch with a little girl. She looked up when they walked in. Hey, Colton. She smiled brightly. Hey, Bella. Hi, Polly. This is my old friend, Adeline. Adeline didn't know which name went with which person, but the adult smiled brightly, and the little girl stood up, spun around like she was dancing, and then sat back down. Polly, my friend Adeline here is a professional dancer, Colton said. She dances on stage for lots of people. The little girl's eyes grew huge. So she was Polly. Adeline smiled at her. Are you a dancer too? Polly nodded so emphatically Adeline worried about her neck health. Where is everyone? Colton asked. In the kitchen, Bella said. Are we meeting in there? Colton asked. I don't think so. I think they went to get pops.
Perfect. Let's get good seats, then. Bella and Polly scooted down to make room for them. Is everyone here? Colton asked. Everyone except Denver and Riker. Cash came back to the living room with a pop. Adeline expected him to hand it to Bella, but he handed it to Polly instead. Bella gave him a critical look. Are you sure that's a good idea? Cash shrugged. It's a special occasion. Bella snorted. No, it's not. Polly tried to guzzle the pop before they could change their minds. Bella gently took it away from her. Slow down, honey. You can have it, but you don't need to shotgun it. Shotgun? Polly repeated in the cutest little voice. Bella gave Cash a wry look. I think you're rubbing off on my vocabulary, and I don't think that's a good thing. Cash laughed as if he was quite proud of this development. Then he squeezed onto the couch beside Bella, which forced Colton to press himself up against Adeline. And he said this visit wouldn't be fun, she thought, trying not to smile. Chapter 19 When Tucker and Gunner returned to the living room, Colton introduced Adeline again, and they both claimed to remember her. He didn't think this was likely, but he didn't argue. Tucker sat in a wing chair and scooted closer to the group, turning the horseshoe of furniture into something that more closely resembled a circle. Okay, Colton. You called this meeting. Go ahead and ask. Colton opened his mouth to answer, but the front door opened before he could. Riker, a pretty woman, and a little boy came through, along with a blast of cold air. Sorry we're late, Riker said. His eyes flicked to the woman as if it was her fault. So this was Riker's new girlfriend. She was gorgeous. How had Riker managed that? Yes, she said, sorry we're late. You haven't missed anything yet. Tucker looked at Colton expectantly. I don't think we've met. I'm Frankie, and this is my son, Waylon. Colton smiled. Nice to meet you. He waited for them to get settled and then took a deep breath and went for it. As most of you know, I am trying to buy the gym that I've been working at. It is for sale, and I can afford to buy it, especially because I think that I can make more money than it is making right now. But the bank is not convinced. They did not approve my loan, so I would like to revisit the idea of selling my portion of the ranch to you guys or to some combination of you so that I can buy the business. We're back to this again? Tucker said. Were you supposed to dial Denver in? Cash said. That's right. Tucker started slapping his pockets, looking for his phone but didn't come up with it. Can someone else do it? I'm not sure we need to dial Denver, Indiana. Colton said. He wanted to get this over with. Well, he wanted to sell his share, Tucker said, so it makes sense if you want to do this that both of you could do it. Tucker was still slapping his pockets. He looked like a nut. Or a man with bugs in his clothes. Are you sure you want to do this? Gunner sounded offended. Before Colton could answer him, Riker said, Hey, we're all here together at the ranch. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. He pressed a button and then put the phone on the coffee table. Uh. Hi, everyone? Understandably, Denver sounded a bit bewildered. Everyone stared at Colton as if it had been his idea to call Denver. Hello? Denver said again. Hi. Colton cleared his throat and scooted closer to the phone, which made him scoot away from Adeline. This made him even more annoyed that they'd insisted on calling Denver. It's Colton. I asked everyone to meet me here because I would like to sell my part of the ranch to buy my gym. Oh. Denver said much more dramatically than he needed to. Colton couldn't help but roll his eyes. But you were against splitting up the ranch when I was the one who wanted to do it, Denver said dryly. Yep, Colton said. I'm still against it, Gunner grumbled. If anyone's asking. The room fell silent. So you want to sell your share, Tucker said, but who do you expect to buy it? It was clear that he didn't want to. Colton shrugged. I have no idea. I don't care. You can distribute my share evenly, or maybe Denver could buy it. Tucker laughed. Denver wants to sell his share. 
Why would he buy yours? Suddenly Colton felt stupid. Maybe this had been a bad idea. He really wished Adeline wasn't witnessing this. I couldn't predict the future, Tucker, Colton said, trying to stay calm. I need money. I have something of value. I am offering it up for sale. If no one wants it, then fine. The room went quiet again. No matter who buys it, Denver said slowly, splitting up the land is going to be a lot of work. And Tucker's right that I don't want it. Why don't I just lend you the money, Colton? Colton blinked in shock. He hadn't been expecting that. But he didn't consider it for long. This was Denver, and he couldn't stand Denver. I'd rather not be beholden to you. Okay. Denver sounded irritated. Then it wouldn't be a loan. How about we co-own the business? Colton winced. That's a good idea, Gunner said. Colton looked at Tucker, who shrugged. It's a good offer. And it probably would be smoother than trying to mess with the deed. But if it were me, I would just take a loan from him, make payments. Treat him like a bank. I'm not sure I want to be treated like a bank, Denver tried to say, but everyone talked over him. They were all trying to convince Colton to take Denver up on his offer. Colton held up his hands. Can you all just stop? Give me a second to think. You don't have to decide now, Denver said. Take some time to think it over. Except Colton didn't have a lot of time. He needed to buy the gym before someone else did. Look, I really wish you had invited me to this little meeting, Denver grumbled. It's hard to communicate my sincerity over the phone. But Colton, please hear that sincerity. It has been a rough few years for our family. Riker got hurt, Dad died, Gunner has had a bear of a time, and I know that we haven't exactly come together to weather the storms. I regret that very much. But we are still a family, and I feel like things are changing. We are acting like a family more than we ever have. We probably have the women to thank for that. He chuckled at his own joke, sounding like a proud old man. Colton, you deserve to own that gym. You will do a great job. You will help people, and that will make you happy, make you feel fulfilled. Please, let me do this for you. Colton was dumbfounded. This did not sound like the Denver he knew. He didn't want to, but he looked to Tucker for advice. Tucker was the one with money smarts. Don't they say it's not a good idea to do business with family? Only people with failing businesses say that, Denver said. Okay, but don't they also say don't borrow money from family? That's for people who value money more than family, wow, so Denver had an answer for everything apparently. Maybe he should have invited him. I trust you, Colton. You are a hard worker. If something goes wrong, it's not going to be a big deal. I have been blessed with a lucrative career. Please let me share some of that blessing. Tucker looked at the phone. What's the interest rate, Denver? No interest, Denver said quickly. Tucker looked at Colton. Colton felt pressured, and he didn't like feeling pressured. Hey, Denver, I'm going to take Colton outside for a minute. We'll be right back. Take your time. Colton didn't want to go outside. It was cold out there, but he followed Tucker through the back door. Immediately, a goat was headbutting him in the leg. He looked up at the pasture to see if he could see General Lee. She was easy to locate because of the bright blue cast on her leg, though the blue was looking a little dingier now. She was standing on top of the castle, as proud as a peacock. Should she be up there? She has a broken leg. What? Tucker said. Who cares? Will you please focus? Colton looked at Tucker. I'm focused. Your partial ownership of this ranch gives you some financial security. It's part of your net worth. Take Denver up on his offer. I don't care whether you like the guy. It's the deal of the century. Colton sighed. Fine. You had to bring me out here for that? I could tell you don't want to do it and I know that when you feel pressured, you push back. I didn't want you to feel like we were ganging up on you. That was pretty insightful for Tucker. Okay, Colton said. 
Tucker slapped him on the upper arm. Good job. You don't have to like it, but it's still the smart play. Chapter 20 You want to go see the goats? Gunner cried with such joy that Adeline laughed. Yes, please. Gunner looked her up and down. Do you have a coat? No, I was out running, she said lamely. Here. Colton draped his coat over her shoulders. She didn't think she would need his coat, but she thanked him. Now Gunner was staring at her running shoes. I have some boots you can borrow. I'll be fine. Gunner didn't seem to believe her, but he started for the back door. By the way, Colton said, General is up on top of the castle. Is she supposed to be up there? Gunner growled. No. Let's go get her down. They stepped outside, and Adeline couldn't believe how many goats there were. She hadn't been expecting such a herd. She followed Gunner and Colton toward the pasture, grateful for a path through the snow, or her footwear would have been a much more serious problem. Most of the goats were contained by a fence, but a few seemed to have squirted free and were now trying to get as close as possible to Gunner. He pushed them out of the way with his knees as he walked. Almost as cute as donkeys, aren't they? Colton said, and she looked at him quickly to see if he was teasing her, but she saw nothing on his face but joy. I'm not so sure, she looked at the goats again. Maybe it's a tie. The truth was that she hadn't spent much time around donkeys or goats. She'd grown up in West Hope, but her family hadn't owned any livestock. She had no idea why as a kid she had thought donkeys were so great. Ahead of them stood a giant structure made of pallets and plywood. A goat jungle gym. There were goats all around it and climbing all over it. A few were stretched out sunbathing. At the tippy top was a single goat with a blue cast on her leg. Adeline gasped. The famous goat who'd made Colton miss their New Year's Eve appointment. How did she get up there with a broken leg? I'm not sure, Colton said, but I'm pretty sure it's a bad idea. Gunner went to the right of the structure, and Colton went to the left. Adeline followed Colton even though she had to step in lots of little goat pearls to do so. Now that she was so close to the structure, she became distracted by the cuteness of the goats at eye level. Can I pat them? Sure, Colton said. She reached out to pat a hornless one, thinking that would be a safe start, but it screeched in her face. She tried not to jump and laughed instead. Does that mean that it doesn't want me to pet it? No idea, Colton said. I don't speak goat. From the other side of the jungle gym, Gunner said, believe it or not, that means they do want you to pet them. She giggled and, more nervously now, reached out again. This time the goat didn't screech, and Adeline was able to run her hand over his head. Wow. Bumpy. Colton laughed softly beside her, and she was a little embarrassed. Their hair is fluffier than I thought it would be. It's this time of year, Gunner said. Their coats get thick for winter. His voice was above her now. Was he climbing on the goat jungle gym? Come on, General Lee. He sounded impatient. Adeline stepped back to look up. General Lee was backing toward her edge of the jungle gym. Careful. Adeline said, as if the goat could hear or understand her. Gunner growled in frustration. She's going the wrong way. General, no. One of the goat's back feet slipped off the edge of the plywood. The goats on the level beneath her scattered. Watch out. Colton threw his arm across Adeline's stomach like a seatbelt. I'm almost there. Gunner cried. But it was too late. The goat was falling. Adeline tried to leap out of the way, but her foot slipped in the goat pearls. Her knee twisted, and she yelped as pain shot up her leg all the way to her stomach. From the corner of her eye, she saw Colton catch the goat, but the weight of her knocked him off balance. He twisted his body as he fell, hugging that goat like a football, and landed squarely on Adeline's back, knocking the wind out of her. They lay there in a tangled heap. Her knee was screaming in pain. Is General okay? Gunner cried. She could hear him trying to scramble down the jungle gym. Adeline caught her breath, which wasn't easy as Colton was still on top of her. Well, at least the goat's okay, she wheezed. 
sorry. He slid off her, and she turned her head to see a goat's eyeballs merely inches from her. The goat looked completely calm. It was chewing its cud. She let her head rest in the dirty snow. She liked donkeys better. Are you okay? Colton asked. He finally let go of the goat, but it didn't go anywhere. He wiggled his hips. Come on, get off me, General. Gunner appeared and scooped the goat off Colton's chest and stood it on all four legs. Are you okay? Is he talking to us or the goat? Adeline said. Not sure. Colton grunted and sat up. Adeline rolled over and sat up as well. Her new running clothes were filthy. She tried to get up, cried out a little, and sat back down. What is it? Colton asked. I twisted my knee, and I can't feel my toes. The goat they called General came to her and nuzzled its horned head into her chest. Get out of the way, General. Colton roughly pushed her aside. Hey! Don't risk your life to save her and then hurt her feelings. Colton laughed. Let's get you inside. Without asking, he scooped her up into his arms. Her stomach fell as if she was on a roller coaster, and she wrapped her arms around his neck without thinking. And then Colton Bridge was carrying her toward the house, and the moment was almost worth the pain. Chapter 21 Colton was surprised to find everyone still at the house. When Riker saw them coming, he swept the couch clean of wayward pillows and tangled blankets. Then he put one pillow back in time for Adeline to lay her head on it. Colton nodded Riker his thanks. Then he looked down at Adeline. May I? Adeline looked confused, but she nodded anyway, and Colton gently lifted her pant leg up over her knee. It was red and swollen. I'm so sorry. He felt awful. He'd injured a professional dancer. It's not your fault. Both of my knees are already bad. I've been dealing with PFP since college. What's PFP? Riker asked, and Colton was shocked to hear from him. He looked up at him and could see real concern in his eyes. Maybe he still had first responder in his blood. Runner's knee, Adeline said as if it were no big deal. Are you a runner? Riker asked. I run some, but mostly I'm a jumper and a spinner and a stomper. Riker's eyes widened. She's a pro dancer, Colton explained. You're dating a professional dancer? In West Hope? Colton's cheeks got hot. We're not dating, but were they? I mean, he looked down at Adeline, but she wasn't any help. She was suddenly really interested in looking at her knee. We are old friends. She lives in Las Vegas now. He gave Riker a dirty look. Where she dances. Oh. Riker said. So you're like a raquette? Adeline laughed. More like Cirque du Soleil. It was clear Riker didn't know what this was. Yeah, Adeline said. Rockets is close enough. Anyway, so runner's knee that I've been told is turning into arthritis in my left knee. Oh good, Colton said dryly. So I crushed your good knee. You didn't crush anything, she said quickly. I twisted it when I fell. That was cold comfort. And this isn't my good knee. This is the knee that I tore my meniscus in. I had surgery on it. It was a long time ago, but it's never been quite the same. He felt sick. Please tell me that this does not feel like that did. It doesn't. I promise. It's not that bad. He didn't know whether to believe her. Should we take you to the, um, just to make sure? Or urgent care? She shook her head. I'm fine. I only twisted it. And please hear me when I say that my knees hurt every single day. Do you mind if I take a closer look? Colton asked. She opened one eye and looked at him. Like with a magnifying glass? Her words caught him by surprise until Riker chuckled, and then Colton knew she was kidding. Because he didn't know what to say, he busied himself looking at her knee instead. He felt all the way around it, watching her body for an involuntary wince or jolt. 
She did neither. Can I get a drink of water, she asked, and he felt stupid for not offering that already. I'll get it, Bella said and disappeared into the kitchen. Are you sure you don't want anything stronger? Cash asked. Adeline laughed, which Colton thought was a good sign. No, thank you. Good, because I don't have anything stronger, Gunner said. Adeline laid a hand on Colton's arm. I really am okay. I'm sorry if I scared you. She did look okay, and he was touched that his feelings had made her list of worries. She looked up at Gunner. Is the goat okay? Yes, but she won't leave the back door. I think she's pretty concerned about the two of you. I'm sorry my visit with them got cut short, Adeline said. I'd like to come over and play with them again sometime, but I don't think today's the day. Gunner chuckled. I'll have to check the general schedule, but I'm pretty confident that you'd be welcome anytime. Chapter 22 Bella returned with a glass of water, and Polly crept in front of Colton for a closer look at Adeline. Concern was clearly written on her face. I'm okay, Adeline assured the little girl. As she took a long drink of water, she became aware of how many eyes were on her. She was used to being in the spotlight, but not like this. You know what would make me feel better, she asked Polly, who shook her head. Would you dance for me? It will distract me from the pain. Polly's eyes grew wide. Oh, don't tell me you're shy. She's not, Cash said, and Bella flashed him a dirty look. Get her some music, Dad, Bella said. Cash whipped out his phone. Adeline waved the bridges away from her. Clear out. Give the girl some room to dance. We're going to have a show. She was amused at how bewildered some of the brothers looked, but she could feel Polly warming to the idea. Her smile was wide and bright, and she was looking at her father, waiting for the music. Adeline recognized the first notes of Taylor Swift's Everything Has Changed. So did Polly. She threw her arms up in the air and started to dance. Before long, Adeline was mesmerized. This little girl moved exactly to the beat and used every part of her body. It was the most moving thing Adeline had seen in some time, and when it was over, Adeline prompted the small crowd in a rowdy applause, to which Polly curtsied and then ran to her dad and ordered him to play another song. He laughed and told her not today. Cash, Adeline said. He looked up at her. I expected to tell you that she is a cute little dancer, but what I'm going to tell you is that she is a natural. She's a gifted little girl. Cash smiled and thanked her, but Adeline could tell that he didn't understand what he had. That was okay. Polly was young, and time was on her side. It was just another reason that Adeline had to keep in touch with Colton, so he could make sure Polly was getting the support she needed, if she wanted it. Okay, Cash said. We need to get going. Me too, Tucker said. I'm ready to go too, Riker said, but do you want any help getting her into the car? I can do it, Colton said, sounding testy. Riker held up his hands. Fair enough. He went for his coat. Do you think you can walk? Colton asked her. Maybe he was ready to go too. I'll try. She was pretty sure that she could. She let him help her up, but the second she put weight on that knee, she involuntarily cried out and fell back onto the couch. Sorry, she said, feeling like a wuss. She hated this feeling. She was not a wuss. Colton stood staring down at her, scratching his chin. So I guess this means the wedding is off? She felt her eyes grow wide as everyone in the room stopped what they were doing and turned to stare at them. Cash, especially, looked amused. Something you want to tell us, Colt? Colton sighed. It was just a joke. Jeesh. The only person who didn't look stunned was Gunner. Did he know about the pact? The room was frozen. Frankie stood there with her coat zipped only halfway. She still held onto the zipper. Her expression suggested she was watching a particularly exciting movie. And they were all staring at her, not Colton, which she didn't understand. He was the one who'd brought up marriage. Future husband, she said, trying to lay the irony on thick. Would you mind carrying me to your truck? 
around the room, eyes got even bigger. Gunner hit a chuckle behind one hand. Yep, he knew. A blushing Colton bent over and scooped her up again. Bella hurried to open the door for them, and Adeline thanked her as Colton stepped out into the bitter cold again. She was still wearing Colton's jacket, and she felt bad. Sorry, guess I shouldn't have said that, he said. I don't mind, but I think they're pretty confused. Except for Gunner. He knows about the pact, doesn't he? Yep. He knows. Sorry. No need to be sorry, she said quickly. We never said it was a secret pact. She tried not to be embarrassed. All people said and did crazy things when they were 18, right? Of course, not all of those people followed through on it when they were 30. Colton started the truck and turned up the heat. Well, congratulations on your deal with Denver. And sorry that I made such a scene. She leaned her head back on the headrest and closed her eyes. Not exactly the impression I wanted to make on your family. Are you kidding? My family is nuts. Well, Bella and Frankie might not be nuts. I don't know yet. Though the fact that they're dating my brothers makes me wonder. She laughed. They both seemed very nice. Some women are just adventurous enough to love a bridge brother. Her cheeks grew hot, and she looked out her window. She needed to change the subject. Denver doesn't seem like he's nuts. That was a pretty awesome offer he made you. Maybe. I can't help but be suspicious. The guy's never been nice to me, but then he falls in love and now all of a sudden he wants to build bridges? Sorry, but I'm skeptical. I think that makes perfect sense. What? How? Think of it like a physical injury. My knees are bad. So are my hips and my lumbar and my neck, but I don't think about any of those things because I'm so busy worrying about my knees. But if I suddenly got my knees healed, then you can bet I would start focusing on my hips. Oh wow, he said after a few seconds. That actually makes sense. I'm smarter than I look. He laughed and then reached across the cab to squeeze her good knee. That is not true. You look brilliant. He was quiet for a minute, and then, sounding like he was a million miles away, he said, so, Jenna healed him of his loneliness, and now he can focus on trying to heal his relationships with us. He shook his head. So weird. Adeline didn't think it sounded weird at all, but she gave him time to process. When he pulled into her parents' driveway, he asked her if she needed a ride to the airport tomorrow. She did, but she was a little sad that he was already talking about tomorrow. Do you want to come in? We could watch a movie or something? Your parents wouldn't mind? She giggled. I'm 30 years old. No, they won't mind. Sure. Let's do it. He actually sounded excited, which made her excited too. Awesome. But first, could you carry me one more time? He smiled broadly. I would be happy to. And he did sound happy. Chapter 23 Your parents don't have any streaming apps? Colton hadn't meant to sound critical, but he couldn't believe it. No apps, but they have DVDs. Do you want to pick one? She pointed to a cabinet beneath their small TV. He couldn't remember the last time he had used a DVD. He hoped he could remember how to make one work. Is it a smart TV? Maybe I could just cast my phone to it? She chuckled. Look at you, sounding all techy. No. That is definitely not a smart TV. He knelt and opened the cabinet to find a small stack of DVDs. He pulled them out and blew a small layer of dust off the top. Adeline giggled. How bad is it? Uh, It's pretty bad. He held up the top DVD case. We've got Jeremiah Johnson. Black. He put Jeremiah back into the cupboard and held up the next option. Or Rocky. No, she said simply. Too bad. He rather liked Rocky. He held up Kenny Rogers as the gambler. She cried out and squeezed her eyes shut. Oh, this is pathetic. Quick, run to Walmart. 
He hesitated. Are you serious? She didn't answer him. Does Walmart still sell DVDs? No, I meant go buy my parents a smart TV. He laughed. I would, but West Hope doesn't have a Walmart. What kind of a town doesn't have a Walmart? The West Hope kind. Seriously, though? She was growing animated. He had no idea she felt so passionate about her big box stores. I've been gone for more than a decade. That's plenty of time for them to get a Walmart. I don't think they want one, he muttered when what he really meant was we don't want one. He held up the next movie. Sweet Home Alabama, he read. What's that? He knew the song. He didn't know the movie. That one actually isn't bad. No? He eyed the cover skeptically. Is it funny? I don't remember. I think it's supposed to be. Okay. Good enough. He straightened and stared at the TV. Where's the DVD player? In that cabinet. He squatted again. Do I have to hook it up? He wasn't sure he would be able to. Nah, it's all ready to go. Just pop the disc in and hand me the remote. He did as he was told. Do you know how to run the remote? It's the same remote they had when I was in high school. No way. Yes, way. Some things don't change. He sat in a nearby chair. Oh boy. This was going to be a long two hours. Something sharp was stabbing him in the butt. They'd had this chair since she was in high school too. You're a grown man, and you do what you want, but that chair is as lumpy as the Tetons, so if you want to sit on the couch, you can. He did want to sit on the couch. Desperately. But she and her injury were taking up all three cushions. I can share, she said and folded her legs. She winced and tried to hide it. I'm good here. Liar, she said. I know I said you were a grown man, but that was back when I thought you could make wise decisions. That was 30 seconds ago. She laughed. I know. Just please get over here. He didn't know where he was going to go, but he got up from the chair. She was trying to pick her feet up, and he started to sit under them. No, no, that's not going to work. She sat up. I'm sorry. Here, she patted the cushion he'd been aiming for. He was so confused. Maybe he should sit on the floor. Look, I'm too self-conscious to put my feet on you. You? He barked out a laugh. Don't you have professional dancer feet? What is there to be embarrassed about? Good point. I don't know. Please sit. He sat, and she tipped over and put her head in his lap. There, isn't that better? Yes, it was much more comfortable than the Teton's chair had been. She picked her head up. Can you pass me that throw pillow? Your quad is too hard. No offense. None taken. He tucked the pillow under her head. It was going to be difficult not to run his fingers through that gorgeous shiny hair. He shoved his hands under his butt. She started the movie, and he had trouble focusing on the story, but it got more interesting when the female character went home to small town Alabama. Have you ever been to Alabama? I have not. You? No. I've never been anywhere. She didn't comment on that, and that was okay, with him. He hadn't meant to sound whiny. It usually didn't bother him that he'd barely left his home state, but being around Adeline made him feel like such a rube. Wait, did I just see the movie camera reflected in the bottom of his beer can? She shushed him. Don't ruin it for me. Ruin it? Haven't you seen this before? At least ten times. He had no idea what to say to that. She'd seen it at least ten times, and she couldn't remember if it was funny? Wait a minute, he said. I'm confused. She groaned. What? He laughed. You're going to ruin it again. He didn't explain his confusion. He was willing to let it go. Go ahead. Oh, good. So she used a fake last name, and everyone is acting like they didn't know that, 
but they all said that they read about her on the internet. So wouldn't they have seen her fake last name then? She gave him a dirty look over her shoulder. You're thinking too hard. You're not supposed to think during movies like this. What? What am I supposed to be doing then? You're supposed to be feeling. She made the word feeling last three seconds, and he didn't know whether she was trying to be funny. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't in case she was being serious. Sorry. He pulled one hand out, pretended to zip his lips shut, and then slid his hand back under his butt. Is your hand cold, she asked. He hadn't known that she was aware of his hand's positioning. No, he offered no further explanation. He went back to concentrating on the movie. He was really starting to dislike it. He was also starting to dislike the main character. Is this how you feel, coming back to your hometown? Like we're all a bunch of backward hicks? Not at all, she said readily, as if she'd been expecting the question. Yes, some stuff around here is backward, but I live in Sin City. I promise you, there is plenty of backward stuff there too. He was only partially comforted by this and remained worried that, like the character in the movie, Adeline couldn't wait to get back to her real city life. But she's not acting like that, a voice in his head argued. Maybe not. When the movie showed a confusing scene of kids feeding farm animals in the middle of the street, Adeline's whole body jerked. At first he thought she'd been stung by a bee, but then she cried out, donkey. He laughed, a bit bewildered. He wanted to ask what was so special about donkeys, but he didn't want to insult her. She answered his unasked question. They're just so cute. Look at that face. He couldn't because the face had already left the screen, but now he wished he had paid more attention so he could comment on the donkey cuteness. The movie grew more romantic, and the main character grew less unlikable. He could tell they were gearing up for a big kiss scene, and Colton grew uncomfortable. And then there it was, the big smooch in the rain. He tried to think of something witty to say and failed. But Adeline didn't say anything either. She snored. He leaned forward to look at her face. Had he really just heard a snore? Did women this beautiful, this graceful, this cultured really snore like a trucker? She snored again, even louder this time, and he tried not to laugh. He knew how hard it was to fall asleep in pain, and he didn't want to wake her. He carefully slid out from under her, and then he returned the pillow and her head to the couch cushion. He pulled the blanket off the back of the couch and covered her up as the credits rolled. Then he finally gave in and reached down to tuck her hair behind her ear. It was every bit as soft as he'd imagined. Good night, beautiful, he whispered. I'll see you tomorrow. Chapter 24 Adeline woke up on the couch with a stiff neck. She looked at the time. Whoa, she'd managed to sleep for twelve hours. The night before came rushing back to her, the goat, the fall, the movie, the snuggles. Something had shifted in her heart during Sweet Home Alabama. Blame it on the movie or the snuggle or the knee pain, but something had changed. She'd gone from being in love with Colton to being in love with Colton. It felt great, but it also felt scary. She'd never felt like this before about anyone. She got up slowly, tentatively testing her knee. It still ached, but it was in a lot better shape than the night before. Thank God. She showered, got dressed, and got herself some breakfast. When she heard a truck pull up, she went to the window. Colton was ten minutes early. Was he eager to see her? She hoped so. She hurried to get outside so that he didn't need to walk to the door. Feeling better, he asked when she climbed into the truck. She couldn't tell if he was surprised or disappointed. Never underestimate the power of rest and ibuprofen. The sight of him took her breath away. Yep, she was in deep now. Do you need to stop anywhere before the airport? No, thank you. And I really do appreciate you running me around like this. Can I give you some gas money? Don't insult me. She looked at him sharply. Was he kidding? She thought so, but she wasn't sure. I promise that I was not insulting you. But I don't want to take you for granted either. He smiled. I was only playing a thought. 
Sorry I fell asleep on you last night. Literally. No need to apologize. I was glad you were able to. I know it's hard to fall asleep when you're in pain. Maybe I've gotten used to it. My knees often hurt at night. So what's the prognosis? Are you just supposed to suffer for the rest of your life? If I keep dancing as much as I do, then yes. And honestly, I've kind of gotten used to it. It's part of the gig now. I do regular physical therapy, try not to eat inflammatory foods, and take ibuprofen when I need to. You be careful with that stuff. I think it's more powerful than they let on. Oh, trust me. I only take it when I have to. He raised his eyebrows. And you had to this morning? I'm about to get on an airplane. If there's one thing in this world that is not knee-friendly, it is the airplane seat. I wouldn't know. I've never flown anywhere. Again, she couldn't tell if he was sad or proud. Why was he so hard to read? Well, you should come visit me sometime. This emotion she could read, surprised. Really? Of course. Let's be real friends. Let's not go more than a decade without speaking to each other this time. She laughed, but she was uncomfortable. That sounds like a good plan. But I think I would just drive to Las Vegas. I imagine that would be a pretty drive, but it's also a very long one. And I'm not sure I'd want to attempt it in January. That's a lot of Wyoming to drive through. Maybe I'll go through the Rockies instead. She snorted. In January? I was thinking of spring. She looked at him. Please don't wait till spring to come see me. Just get on an airplane like a normal person. Maybe. He tightened his grip on the wheel. We'll see. It sounded like the same kind of, we'll see, that her parents used to use on her. It meant no. Her heart sank. Maybe this was it. Maybe it was unrealistic to think that they were going to be friends now. Their lives were too different. Well, you can at least text or call? He nodded without looking at her. Sure. I can do that. The air in the cab felt heavy, sad. He looked at her. I would like to keep in touch for real. Good. That was good news. With little early morning traffic, they got to the airport quickly, and she was sad. She was excited to get back to her show business life, but she didn't want to get out of Colton's truck. He got out first, and then she felt pressure. It was pretty stupid to sit there alone, plus he had pulled up in the unloading zone and a man in a yellow vest was watching them closely. She got out and limped over to him. Are you sure you're going to be able to dance? I have a backup to fill in if I need her to. She didn't want to talk about dancing, and yellow vest man was still eyeing them. Her clock was ticking. She stepped closer to him. Colton, I can't tell you how much fun I've had the last few days. He didn't try to hide his surprise. I know we didn't do anything that exciting, but just hanging out with you has been so great. You are every bit as awesome as you used to be, and as awesome as I knew you would become. Her voice grew thick with emotion. It makes me kind of proud of myself that I could see into the future. He surprised her with wet eyes. He looked away. I've had fun too, he said stiffly. She needed to hug him. She wanted to kiss him, and this might be her last chance. He leaned in for what she knew was going to be a kiss on her left cheek, but she didn't let him get away with that. She caught his right cheek with her left hand and gently pulled his lips to hers. She had expected it to be a simple kiss, short and sweet, but that's not what happened. The earth fell away beneath her feet, and she wrapped her right arm around his waist lest she fall into the abyss. The kiss was a hundred times more powerful than she'd expected, and she had been expecting power. She couldn't make herself pull away, and his enthusiasm wasn't helping. She had expected him to be formal and stiff-lipped, but he was kissing her back like it meant something. She wasn't sure what to make of that, but she didn't have the bandwidth to figure it out. She was too busy experiencing the kiss. His hand found the back of her head, and his fingers made her scalp tingle. She really hoped he wouldn't let go of her because if he did, she would crumble into a puddle of go at his feet. 
someone nearby loudly cleared their throat. She didn't want to look. She didn't want the kiss to end, but Colton pulled away. Sorry, he said to Yellow Vest Man. Then he looked down into her eyes again. I'm sorry that our lives are so different, Adeline said, breathless. It would have been fun to marry you. He pulled away a little more, and she wondered if she'd gone too far. Maybe she shouldn't have talked about marriage. She smiled brightly to let him know that she was mostly kidding. But then he shocked her when he said, it would be fun to marry you too. She let go of him and instantly missed him. Tell you what. If we're not married by 40, let's meet at that football field on New Year's Eve. She expected a laugh, but instead he looked disappointed. Unsure of how to handle this reaction, she kept going with her original train of thought. But this time, you have to show up. Bring the goat if you need to. Chapter 25 It had been two weeks since Colton had dropped Adeline off at Rapid City's airport. Though he was finalizing his deal with the gym, and though he was excited about his future, it had still been a depressing two weeks. He hadn't realized how much she had gotten under his skin until he watched her walk into that airport. Now he missed her horribly, and he was trying not to. It didn't make sense why he was so emotionally tangled up in this. She lived in Las Vegas for crying out loud. It might as well be a different planet. They had texted quite a bit those first few days, but somehow this had made it worse for him, so he had taken longer and longer to reply to her texts, and then her texts had slowed as well. He figured that this was going to fizzle out and turn back into nothing, the same nothing it had been for those 12 years. At least that's how he hoped it would go down. Because he didn't like the ache in his chest that came from missing her. He didn't like pining after a woman he couldn't have, he didn't like feeling not good enough. To distract himself, when his client Carissa asked him out for the tenth time, he said yes. She could not hide the surprise on her face, and he almost laughed. Where do you want to go, she asked, all smiles. Isn't that up to you? You're the one who asked me out. When her face fell, he said, what can I say? I'm a forward-thinking kinda guy. Do you like fire? Did he like fire? Sure, if it was keeping him warm. Not so much if it was burning his house down. Then he realized that she was talking about the only true nightclub in Rapid, and his stomach sank. Don't they not open until like midnight? She giggled. How old are you? He didn't answer that. They open at 11, but we can get dinner first. He had made a mistake. Sure, why not? But I'm not much of a drinker. Great. You can drive. His stomach sank deeper. What had he done? Pick me up at 8? It was a good thing she was pretty because this was going to be awful. Sure. Pick you up at 8. At least he wouldn't be pining away for Adeline. Colton hadn't consciously been late to pick Carissa up, but his subconscious might have been stalling. He pulled into her driveway at 10 minutes past 8. He was starving. He usually ate supper at 6 like a normal person. And they still had to go all the way to Rapid. When she answered the door, he told her she looked great, and he hoped that he sounded convincing. It was true, but his heart just wasn't in this. Guilt washed over him. Maybe he shouldn't have accepted this date. He didn't want to lead her on. Sometime tonight, he would tell her that he wasn't interested in a relationship, which was only partially a lie. He was so mixed up that he didn't know what he was interested in right now. When they got back to the truck, she announced that they had reservations at the same steakhouse he had taken Adeline to. He hadn't realized that he had reacted until she said, What? What's wrong? He didn't want to tell her. Nothing. I love that place. He was grateful when they were not seated at the same table, but still the whole place vibrated with the memory of Adeline. And when Carissa ordered a salad for her meal, Colton truly longed for the woman who had ordered the porterhouse. They handed their menus over, and Carissa said, I'm not an idiot. What? I never said you were. You're not into me. He sighed. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be rude. You are a beautiful woman. But? 
If he had known how to finish that sentence, he would have already done it. I don't know. Like I said, you're a beautiful woman, but that's where it stopped for him. He didn't have the urge to get to know her. While he didn't mind spending time with her, he would just as soon be home alone. She leaned back in her chair. Fine. Do you want to go? No, he didn't. He was starving. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. She sighed. It's fine. I'm not mad or anything. I just really like you, Colton. And when you said yes, to go out with me, I thought maybe I was winning you over. I can see now that I was wrong. We definitely don't have to go to fire. His guilt grew. He should not have accepted this date. I'm sorry. Let me buy you dinner, at least. She smiled tentatively. Okay. She glanced in the direction of the kitchen. But until they bring the food? You have to talk to me. She had a point. It would be pretty awkward to sit there in silence. Right. So what do you like to do in your spare time, you know, when you're not in the gym? Well, I work, a lot. He had to flip through his mental files for a few seconds to remember where she worked, but then he had it. The grocery store. And do you like working at Fairway? I mean, it's a job. I don't hate it, but no, it's not exactly my dream career. And what is your dream career? She shrugged. I guess I've never really had one. That's how I ended up at a grocery store. He chuckled. Well, decide right now. If you could have any job in the world, what would it be? She thought for a while but didn't come up with anything. Well, you're into health and fitness, right? Her eyes darkened a little. Not really. I started working out to lose weight, but I only kept working out because of you. In fact, I kind of hate it. He chuckled, but the guilt was strong. If he was going to go on a date to distract himself from Adeline, he probably shouldn't have picked a girl who liked him as much as this one did. Well, you've been a client for a long time, but maybe now that I'm such a disappointment, maybe you don't have to do it anymore. He expected her to argue, but he could see it in her eyes. She was done with him in every way. You can always pick it up again if you decide that you miss it. Or there's another gym in town. He didn't want to come between her and physical fitness. Maybe. So, if you don't have a dream job, what do you do for fun? Maybe something that you enjoy as a hobby could turn into a job. She narrowed her eyes. What are you, some kind of career counselor? He chuckled. Hardly. Obviously, I'm not very good at it. She laughed, and the mood lightened. I don't know. I guess I like to watch good TV shows, not like those stupid reality series, but good shows that tell a story. Have you seen Sweet Home Alabama? She laughed. I don't think so. What's that? He shrugged, suddenly embarrassed. It was bad enough that he'd thought of it, but then he'd actually said it aloud. Just a dumb movie that I saw recently. What kind of movie was it? He didn't know. Was it like a comedy or action or drama or romance? Romance, I think. She gave him a bewildered look. Why were you watching a dumb romance movie? That was a good question, and he wasn't going to answer it, at least not truthfully. I didn't have a lot of choices, so I just picked what was there. In hindsight, it wasn't the best decision. Chapter 26 It had been two weeks since Adeline had returned to Las Vegas. It had been one week since she'd declared her knee was ready for dancing, but her boss had still made her wait. In the meantime, she'd been helping with the choreography. She thought this would be busy work, but they had actually taken some of her suggestions. They were getting ready for a new show, and Adeline was excited about it. But first, they had to finish the run of their current production. And then finally, she got the green light to step back onto the stage. The lights were bright, the crowd was murmuring, and it felt like home. She started dancing, expecting to feel the familiar elation that came from being in the spotlight, but it wasn't the same. While it certainly felt wonderful, something was missing. 
she still gave her performance her all, lest her boss blame anything on her knee, and when she was done, she was exhausted. She collapsed in a chair backstage. Are you okay? Jasmine asked. Absolutely. I guess I'm a little out of shape. Jasmine looked skeptical. I don't see how that's possible. I've seen what Tylene has been doing to you. Adeline almost winced at the mention of the physical therapist's name. She was a wonderful, skilled, and caring woman, but she knew how to work her patients. That's true. I guess I have been exercising, even if I haven't been dancing full-time. Maybe you're coming down with something. Goodness, she hoped not. She'd just gotten back to it. She didn't want to have to take any more time off. But your knee is okay? Adeline nodded. As good as it's going to get, I think. On the way back to her apartment, Adeline got a text from her mom asking about the show. It went great, Adeline texted back. Really? Yes, really. Why wouldn't it? Her mother sent three shrugging emojis, and Adeline wished she had never taught the woman about emojis. Good night, mom. I love you. She shoved her phone into her pocket and went up the stairs to her apartment. She kicked her boots off and dumped a salad kit into a bowl before plopping down in front of the television. The first thing she saw was an advertisement for a Reese Witherspoon movie. Something too much like sickness washed over her. Was that what was wrong with her? Was she missing Colton? That didn't make much sense. She had always known that she didn't have a chance with him. Slipping off for a New Year's Eve rendezvous and a few fun days in the country hadn't changed her real life. This was her home. This was her career. She was a dancer. She closed her eyes and chewed, trying to concentrate on her emotions, trying to figure out what they meant, but it was too confusing. This was frustrating. She was usually an emotionally intelligent woman. She opened her eyes and decided to give up. She would eat her salad and enjoy some television. Then she would go to bed, and tomorrow when she got up on stage, she would be right back to normal, enjoying every second of it. She looked at her phone one more time after she slid under the covers. She told herself that she was doing this out of habit, not because she hoped to see a text from Colton. He hadn't texted her in days. This was so annoying, and she wished that it made her care about him less. It didn't, though. It just hurt. He wasn't ghosting her exactly, but every time she texted him, it took him more than 24 hours to answer. It was pretty hard to carry on a charming and pithy conversation that way. By the time he answered, she had usually forgotten what she had wanted to talk about in the first place. She stared at her phone. Why did she have such an urge to text him right now? Why was she missing him so much? This was so annoying. No. She put her phone down. She was going to be strong. There were plenty of fish in the sea. She did not need to spend one more second trying to snag that one. Chapter 27 Colton stopped and looked at the front door of the gym, the keys dangling from his right hand. This was a big moment, and he was sad that he was doing it alone. It was his now, all his. He was about to step into his gym for the first time. It didn't feel quite as exciting as he thought it would, but it still felt good. It felt right. It felt like the next step in a journey that had already been planned somehow. He went the rest of the way to the building, unlocked the door, and swung it open. The first thing he would do is turn up the heat. Timmy always kept it uncomfortably cold, using the excuse that he wanted to make sure his clients didn't get too warm. Then he ended up with people wearing knit caps on the treadmill. No more of that, not on Colton's watch. He would put client first, not profit first, and intuitively he knew that this would result in more profit overall. He flicked on the lights and the music and then changed the station. Timmy had always insisted on the angry headbanging stuff. Colton thought uplifting and inspiration might do better. He always worked out better with Rend Collective playing in the background. He went to the closet and got out some boxes and garbage bags, which he carried to Timmy's office. Timmy had packed up, but he'd left some junk behind. Colton planned to get the office in order and then tackle the large spare room. 
Despite there not being much stuff left, it still took him nearly an hour to clean out the office, and by then it was time to open. He didn't have any training sessions that morning, but people would be coming in to work out independently. It was still January. Still busy. The first dozen clients through the door didn't seem to notice anything had changed, but the next one congratulated him, and the one after that brought him a congratulatory cake. He chuckled at the irony of it, but he appreciated the gesture. He raised his voice to offer some to anyone else, but no one took him up on it. He took it into the kitchenette, intending to indulge later. When he came back out, Jonathan the cake giver asked him if he needed any help with anything. Colton hesitated, sensing a ploy for pay, but the guy put his hands up. Just trying to help, not trying to score a job. Colton laughed uncomfortably. The truth was that he could use some help. I'm going to get rid of a few of those old machines. After your workout, if you want to help me move them into my pickup, that would be great. I can do it right now, make it part of my workout. Colton considered it and decided why not. As they struggled to get the ancient treadmill moved outside, Jonathan asked Colton where he was taking the equipment. The dump. Jonathan laughed. You might want to try Goodwill first. Are you sure? These are really old machines. But they work, correct? Somebody might pay 25 bucks and then actually walk a few miles. It was a convincing pitch, and Colton bit. Good call. Goodwill is closer anyway. By the time Colton returned from Goodwill, Jonathan had gone back to his real workout. Carissa had shown up too. He was surprised and happy to see her there, and he was sure both of those reactions showed on his face because she flashed him a hundred watt smile. I wasn't expecting to see you, he said. I wanted to congratulate you. He was touched. He hadn't known that Carissa was keeping up on the process. Everyone's talking about it. People think you're going to do a good job. And I guess I don't hate working out as much as I thought because I've kind of missed it. This was good news. He was relieved to hear that her time with him hadn't been entirely wasted. Though he had no idea why people believed in him. Other than the fact that he was a football hero a hundred years ago, they didn't know anything about his qualifications. Also, I've been asked to ask you, she started. She wrung her hands in front of her. Oh no. Here it comes. Some women want Zumba classes. Oh, was that all? And one mom asked me if I could get karate classes for her son? First thing would be to find a karate teacher. I certainly don't know karate. She raised an eyebrow. Is that really the only thing standing in your way? He glanced at a closed door behind her. Pretty much. And how long it takes me to clean up that spare room. She looked over her shoulder. We have a spare room? It was cute that she'd said we. They used to have classes in there and some free weights, but it's a big room and it cost a lot to heat, so Timmy shut it down for one winter and then never reopened it. It became a storage room, but really it's just full of junk. Her eyebrows went up. Can I see? You want to see a room full of junk? She shrugged. Maybe I'm just trying to avoid my workout. He laughed. Let me find the key. When he returned, she was leaning on the wall beside the door. He unlocked it, and cold air rushed in at them. He swung the door open, and it banged into something. Oh no. It was worse than he thought. He hadn't been in here in a long time. He squeezed through the narrow opening, and Carissa followed. He felt along the wall for a light switch, and she produced her phone flashlight, which sped up the hunt. He flicked on the lights and was almost surprised when they worked. Wow. It is big. She sounded impressed. It was bigger than he remembered, though it was hard to tell with all that junk shoved in there. How had Timmy even acquired so much clutter? Hardwood floors, she said. Fancy. This gave him a thought, a weird and wild thought that didn't seem to come from his own head. He tapped his heel into the floor a few times to see how it would sound. What you doing? Carissa asked, sounding suspicious. He pointed at the opposite wall. There are mirrors over there. Okay. 
Are we just making random observations now? He chuckled. No, I just had forgotten that. You forgot about the mirrors? Yes. Or, back when he'd known that there were mirrors in this room, they hadn't meant anything to him. Okay, I'm cold. Let's go. He returned to the light switch. He let Carissa go out first and then followed her and locked the door behind them. He was on his way back to his office when Jonathan said, I can help you clean that room out this weekend. Colton thanked him and then thought he would also try to get a few brothers to help with the heavy lifting. He had saved the same goat now, twice. Gunnar sort of owed him. When he made it back to his office, he sat in Timmy's old chair and thought about how he had to get a new one, one that was ergonomically correct. He took out his phone and opened his text thread with Adeline. It was time to ask her a question that he had been asking her steadily up until a few days ago. He should have kept asking it, but now he really needed to know. With nerves dancing in his belly, he wrote, How is your knee? Chapter 28 When Adeline saw who had texted her, she almost dropped her phone. She looked around to see if anyone had seen her embarrassing phone bobbling, but no one was paying her any mind. They were at afternoon rehearsal, though they weren't doing much rehearsing. Mostly they received notes from the night before and discussed anything that needed fine-tuning, so for the most part, she was just sitting around. She scooted a little farther from the crowd to answer, General Lee's favorite knee is back to normal, which is to say, pretty sore. She laughed at her own wit as she hit send. Only then did she realize that her message might be ambiguous. It's fine, really, she wrote. Good to hear, he wrote immediately. Interesting. Why was he responding so quickly all of a sudden? And why had he initiated the conversation? Why, what's up? Are you back in the show? This was suspicious. Had someone stolen his phone? Some meddling matchmaker? I am. Great. I was thinking it was time for me to take my first airplane ride. Her heart rate accelerated so quickly that she feared injury. When? I'll get you a ticket. Now there was the pause. Oh no. He was gone again. This was going to get old. Just in case she'd confused him, she wrote, I meant a ticket for the show. Not a plane ticket. <laughs> Her phone chimed before she could hit send. Oh, good. He hadn't thought she was buying him a plane ticket. Not that she wouldn't be willing to. Can you get two? I'm going to try to make Tucker come. That was considerably less romantic, but okay. Sure, two tickets. When do you want to come? Wait. Do you have to pay for them, or is this a perk of the job? Perk. Oh, good. Cause I'm a fancy business owner now and can afford my own recital tickets. She giggled aloud, and several of her peers gave her dirty looks. She scooted even farther away, shaking her head at him calling it a recital. If that's what he was expecting, he was in for a surprise. When do you want to come, she asked again. He gave her a date that was disappointingly far out, but it gave her plenty of time to make arrangements. And it was fair that he probably didn't want to spend a fortune on last-minute airplane tickets. Great. I'll have your tickets, she wrote. Let me know when you get to the city, and I'll make sure I get them to you. Thank you. She wanted to keep the conversation going. Is everything okay? It sure is. I signed the papers on the gym yesterday. Her heart leapt. How great for him. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you. Thank you, he wrote again. What, was he using autofill? How does it feel? Pretty surreal, actually. Doesn't feel as big as I thought it would, but it's good. What did that mean? It didn't feel as big? Then she remembered how it had felt to step back out onto the stage and thought maybe she understood what he meant. That hadn't felt as grand as she thought it would either. Maybe there was a danger in looking forward to something too much. Do you have a lot of work to do there? To get it the way you want it? Not too bad. Sorry, I have to go. Client coming in. But I'm glad your knee is feeling better. 
She wrote, thank you, and hit send. He didn't respond, but she couldn't help but add, I'm so happy for you. Truly. Congratulations again. It was true. She was happy for him. Elated even. All of his dreams were coming true. And also, I'm super excited that you're coming to a show. Okay, bye. She jammed the phone into her pocket before she could pester him anymore. What a pleasant development this was. She had something to look forward to now. Colton would be in her audience. She couldn't wait to perform for him. She couldn't wait to dance for him. She couldn't wait to show him who she really was. After all these years, he still didn't know. Not really. Things were about to change. Chapter 29 I'm sorry, what? Tucker Bridge sat at his kitchen table facing his brother Colton. You heard me. Come on, it will be fun. Take Riker. What? Colton looked horrified. There are so many things wrong with that suggestion. It's not as bad as you think. He's really getting out and about now. He's not nearly as self-conscious. And he's been there. Colton still looked horrified. I don't think we can get along for that long. And even if we could, I'm looking for someone who might be sympathetic when I act like a scared little girl on the plane. Tucker tried not to smirk. And you don't think Riker can do that for you? Have you met Riker? So you're not inviting me because you think that I'll enjoy it. You just want someone to hold your hand on the plane. This was weird. Tucker wasn't exactly known for being compassionate. I'm not inviting you at all. I am begging you to go with me. Tucker narrowed his eyes. Could his tough-as-nails brother really be this nervous about flying? What do you think is going to happen? You know that the chances of a plane crash are pretty small, right? Maybe. I also know that the chances of me getting lost trying to find my way to Adeline's casino are pretty high. Her show is at Paradise, right? Colton nodded. So that place is like 80 acres. I'm pretty sure you can't miss it. Colton's jaw tightened. Are there signs pointing to it from inside the airport? Tucker frowned. Of course not. Then I won't be able to find it, he said slowly. Tucker sighed. Just get in a cab and say, take me to paradise. Colton barked out a laugh. Oh, sure. That's just what I want to say to a complete stranger. They'll either think I'm propositioning them or asking them to drive me off a cliff. Tucker rolled his eyes. Isn't there someone else you can ask? There really isn't. I mean I have a few friends, but… Tucker waved his explanation away. He understood. Colton's few friends were immature idiots who would likely embarrass him in Las Vegas. Tucker leaned forward and put his elbows on the table. I'll be honest. I'm not sure I would navigate it much better than you would. I'm not much of a city guy myself. Right, but we could figure it out together, and then no one would ever have to know how rough it was. Tucker chuckled. Despite himself, he was actually being persuaded. So we're just going to watch the show, spend the night, and then fly home in the morning? Colton nodded. That's the plan. And you have no intention of gambling? Because I'm really not going anywhere near that. Colton raised an eyebrow. Like you don't have money to lose. Exactly. I'm afraid that if I won, I might develop a taste for it. Colton sighed and leaned back. No, it hasn't even occurred to me to gamble. I don't even know how to gamble. You don't know how to play poker? Colton shook his head. Tucker didn't know why he was so surprised. He only knew the basic rules himself. And you've looked at the flights? Are they affordable? Don't worry about that. The plane ticket is on me. I know how you are. Tucker thought he should probably be offended, but he wasn't. That's generous of you, but I don't think the show tickets are cheap either. Adeline is getting those for us. He couldn't believe he was getting talked into this. Can it wait till next month? I have pheasant hunt scheduled, and I've got to find someone to watch Sundance. 
He glanced at the Brittany sitting beside him, he already looked worried that Tucker was about to leave him. Sure, Colton said. Tucker sighed. Was he actually going to do this? He was letting his curiosity override his reason. But they were paying for it. Okay. Okay? Colton was stunned. Tucker laughed. Okay. What's the worst that can happen? Colton shuddered. Don't say that. I'm thinking the worst that can happen in Las Vegas is pretty bad. I don't know. Doesn't the mob control crime there? Colton laughed at him, and Tucker grew annoyed. I don't think there's mob in Las Vegas anymore. How would you know that? Colton shrugged. Adeline has told me quite a bit about the place. Unless we go someplace shady, we should be fine. Isn't the whole city shady? Colton ignored his question. She said that there are some pickpockets on the strip, but that the biggest threat are people who dress up and ask for money. Tucker shook his head. What? He pictured beggars in prom gowns and tuxes. You know, they dress up like superheroes and cowboys and then ask for money. Why would I give money to a superhero cowboy? No. Colton shook his head, exasperated. They're not the same person. Well, I mean, I guess they could be, it seemed he had confused himself. Anyway, let's just go and find out, okay? We won't carry much cash, and we won't give any money to anyone. That last part could have gone without saying. Chapter 30 Colton and Tucker were too tall for their plane seats. People do this? Colton grumbled. Tucker snapped his seatbelt into place. Yep, people do this. A lot. Some people do it every day. Colton shook his head. He couldn't imagine wanting to go somewhere bad enough to put himself through this torture, and the plane hadn't even taken off yet. Of course, he was doing it for love, or something like it. He looked around at the other passengers. Were they all doing it for love? I'm genuinely sorry that I got you into this. Tucker chuckled. I still can't believe you managed it. Don't worry, I'll get you back one day. Colton knew this was true. His brothers had been torturing one another for decades, and somehow it just kept coming out even. He leaned back in his seat and tried to look out the tiny window. From this angle, there wasn't much of a view. Are we going to fly over the Rockies? I can't imagine how else we'd get there, Tucker said. I think they're sort of in the way. This made Colton feel stupid, but he let it go because he didn't want to fight. The plane was smaller than he thought it would be. Was this good or bad? Were larger planes more likely to crash into something? Or were they tougher because of their size? If this were a cross-country trip, he would rather be in a Peterbilt than a Fiat, but he wasn't sure the same logic applied in the skies. The plane started rolling, and he gripped both armrests. You're good, Tucker said. He said it so matter-of-factly that Colton looked at him to see if he was being critical, but his concern appeared genuine. I promise. You're good. Colton nodded and tried not to think about where he was. Did I tell you that a cat got loose on Adeline's flight to Rapid? Tucker frowned. Like on the plane? Colton nodded. I guess it was quite an ordeal. It ran around attacking people until some cowboy cat whisperer saved the day. Tucker chuckled. That poor cat. Yeah, Colton said thoughtfully. Adeline said that it was in a carrier under the seat in front of its owner. I would have tried to escape too. No kidding. Tucker was being so nice to him that Colton was tempted to tell him the scoop. Can I run something by you? Of course. I want to hear your thoughts, but be tactful, okay? This is a business question, but my heart's all tangled up in it. Tucker leaned away from him a little. This is shaping up to be the most touchy-feely conversation we've ever had. Colton laughed. I'll try to wrench it back a notch. Thank you. Tucker stared at him expectantly. The plane left the ground with a scary rumble that made him wonder just what exactly was holding this buggy together. As inertia pressed him back into his seat, he closed his eyes and wondered why he had waited till he was 30 to take his first flight. 
This would have been so much less scary when he was young and malleable. Tell me about your heart, Tucker said. Colton laughed and opened his eyes. Then he took a deep breath. He looked out the window at the rapidly shrinking South Dakota landscape and then decided maybe he shouldn't be looking at that. He looked at Tucker instead. There's this giant room in my gym. Timmy used it years ago, but it's been storage for a long time. And I had forgotten how nice it was until I just looked at it. Hardwood floors, mirrors all along one wall, he waited for Tucker to catch up. And? Are you thinking about expanding into it? Or renting it out? I'm wondering if there's a professional dancer I know who might want to open a dance school there. Tucker's expression made his thoughts clear, he thought it was a horrible idea. He hadn't needed to use tact because he hadn't even gotten a word out. I can see the logic, he said slowly, obviously trying to choose his words carefully. Never mind. It was just a thought. Is that why we're going to Las Vegas? Not really, Colton lied. We're going to Las Vegas because I want to see her perform. And because I miss her. Tucker was staring at him. He knew he was lying. I can see your logic, Tucker said slowly, but she's young, right? Your age. So nowhere near retirement? Why would she want to give up a great career to teach dance lessons to snotty little brats in West Hope? That was a reasonable question, and one Colton did not have the answer to. He leaned back in his seat again and tried to focus on how scared he was of flying instead. Colton let Tucker lead the way when they landed in Las Vegas. It was a very long walk, followed by a fast train ride, followed by another long walk to a door that actually let them outside. Colton gasped at the fresh air, which didn't taste so fresh. Tucker managed to get them into a cab and then told the smiling man behind the wheel to take them to paradise. Colton stifled a laugh. Though the driver didn't flinch, it still sounded pretty strange to Colton. He kept an eye on the windshield in case there was a cliff coming. Instead of a cliff, he saw the world's biggest emoji rolling its eyes and wondered if he was hallucinating. What in the wide world of sports is that? I have no idea. Tucker sounded as bewildered as Colton felt. The driver laughed. That is our sphere. It shows lots of different things. Keep an eye on it. Sometimes it's an ocean. Sometimes it's a fire. Right now it's a face. Tucker and Colton exchanged a look. They certainly weren't in Kansas anymore. How do we get the tickets? Tucker asked after they'd settled into their room. Only minutes before, Colton had texted Adeline that same question, and the answer had embarrassed him. We're supposed to go to the concierge. Where's he? No idea. Colton had foolishly thought that he would see Adeline before the performance, but apparently that wasn't how this was done. I guess I can go wander around and try to find him. Or her. Tucker stood up. I'll go with you. I don't want you to get lost. He didn't say it with malice. Probably a good idea. Colton looked down at his phone out of habit, but there were no new messages. The most recent one had said, I'll find you after the show. Don't leave. So that was encouraging, at least. Chapter 31 Knowing that Colton was out there in the audience was giving Adeline her first case of stage fright in a long time. She didn't understand the jitters. She was confident. It wasn't like she was afraid of messing up in front of him. In fact if she did, she was pretty sure he wouldn't even know unless she actually managed to fall flat on her face, and with no goats around, she didn't think that was likely. She heard her cue and made her entrance. As the stage lights bathed her in white light, she gave her best Vegas smile. She was always energized by this, but tonight even more so. Of course she could not see the audience, but she always knew they were there. She could always feel them, feel their energy, feel their eyes, and tonight she could feel his energy and his eyes. She couldn't wait to see him. And while, of course, she had known that she had a crush on the man, the strength of this excitement still caught her off guard. Despite the emotional storm going on inside her and the show's runtime of a full two hours, it was still over in a blink. She changed into normal clothes as quickly as she could and then made her way out to the seats. 
More than half of the crowd had dispersed, but she still had trouble finding him. He wasn't where he was supposed to be and for a second she panicked that he'd never been there at all. No, this couldn't be. She remembered feeling him there. She wouldn't have imagined that. Maybe he had simply gone to the wrong seats. No, that was silly too. Someone else would have been in those seats. She slid her phone out of her pocket to text him, but that's when she saw him. He had come halfway to the stage and was staring at her. His brother Tucker stood beside him smiling goofily. Colton looked a bit pale. It took some effort not to run to him like she was in some scene at the end of a rom-com, but her feet still moved pretty quickly. She could not, however, keep herself from flinging her arms around him. He returned the embrace and picked her up off her feet as he squeezed her. When he set her back down, she had to fight not to kiss him. Tucker's proximity made that fight winnable. I'm so glad you came. Thank you. You're welcome. He didn't look so good. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. She waved away his apology. It didn't take you long at all. I know that you have a life, and Las Vegas isn't exactly next door. His face was still expressionless. Hey, are you feeling okay? Tucker snickered, and she flashed him a dirty look. Who had invited that guy anyway? I got a little airsick, and I'm not sure I've recovered. Tucker's expression suggested that this was not the whole story. Do you have some Dramamine, she asked. Colton shook his head. He'd rather suffer than take a pill, Tucker said sounding over the top critical. Again, who invited this guy? Well, let's at least find you some ginger ale. What are you guys doing now? She wished she could separate the two of them and have Colton to herself. It's late, Colton said. We've got an early flight. A chill raced over her. What did that mean? Was he really going to ditch her? You can sleep on the plane. He shook his head. Sorry, I'm really quite tired. Tucker was glaring at him. She was missing something here. You are on the Las Vegas Strip, she said. Right in the middle of it. Let me at least buy you a Coke. Just give me an hour. Let's go look at the lights. She stopped herself. She didn't want to beg the man. Colton looked like he was going to protest again, but Tucker intervened. We would love to go onto the strip with you. Please protect us from those superhero cowboys who ask for money. She frowned. What? Ignore him, Colton said. Okay. Let me grab my purse. She wanted to kick herself for forgetting it, and she worried that he was going to vanish before she could get back. She held up one finger. One minute. Don't move. She hurried backstage. Most of her friends had cleared out, but two of them remained, one of which was standing there with her jaw dropped open. Who are those guys? Jasmine asked slowly, enunciating each syllable. Friends from back home. Which one's yours? Neither, but she said, the tall one. They're both tall, Heather said. The taller one. Adeline started to back away. She was proud to have visitors her friends found so intriguing, but she was anxious to get back to them. Is he a real cowboy? Jasmine asked. Adeline looked up sharply to see if she was teasing, but it appeared to be a sincere question. If you're asking if he herds cows for a living, then no. But if you're asking if he has the spirit and the heart of a cowboy, then definitely. She could almost feel herself slipping deeper into love as she said the words. Can I come with you? Heather asked. Jasmine punched her lightly on the arm. I saw them first. But I asked first. No one's going, Adeline said, and they both looked crestfallen. I have to go. I'll make it up to you guys. Jasmine called after her, how are you going to find me a cowboy, her voice faded in the distance, thank goodness. Adeline breathed a sigh of relief when she found Colton and Tucker right where she'd left them. Ready? She tried to sound chipper, tried to force her chipperness on them. What was wrong with them? Neither of them answered her, so she looped her arm through Colton's. Follow me. 
my name is Adeline, and I will be your tour guide this evening. She laughed, and they didn't join her. Great. She was stepping out onto the strip with two sticks in the mud. Chapter 32 Colton was so uncomfortable that it was making him physically ill. He had sort of lied about the air sickness. It had happened, but it had faded soon after they'd landed. This was something else. He had tried to explain it to Tucker in the brief recess between the end of the show and when Adeline found them, but he had failed to articulate the problem. Or maybe Tucker was just dense. He had come into the show with feelings for Adeline Sharp. Feelings that felt good, like a good song or leaves in the wind. But once he had seen her on that stage, these feelings had morphed into something powerful, like for Elise or a tornado. He was in love with her. But the timing was cruel. Now that he had seen who she really was, now that he knew how strongly he could feel for her, he also knew that they were an impossible dream. She was the very definition of a big deal. She was a superstar. He was a nobody. If they hadn't gone to high school together, she wouldn't know that he existed. What was he doing here in this crazy city? What had he been thinking? Tucker had been right. Of course she wouldn't be interested in being a lowly West Hope dance teacher. What a stupid idea. Since he'd figured this all out, he'd been fighting to do damage control, trying not to feel what he was feeling, to come back to reality, to plant his boots back on the ground. But then she'd been almost running toward him and then she hugged him like she was in love with him and then he thought she was going to kiss him. This made the fight so much harder. It felt like a mile-long walk just to escape the casino where the show had been held, but finally they spilled out into a parking lot full of water fountains. This wasn't the door that he'd come in. That's a lot of water, Tucker said. Under better circumstances Colton would have laughed at that, but he didn't. Would you like to go for a closer look? Adeline asked. Hordes of people already surrounded the fountains. No, Colton said quickly. Okay. This way then. She led them to the right, and they joined the river of people walking on the wide sidewalk. I can't believe there are this many people here in February, Tucker said. You should see it in the spring. Colton did not want to see it in the spring. This was bad enough. He never wanted to see it again. Of course, on some level he had known it would be like this. He had been expecting a crowd. But to be in the middle of it with the sounds pounding in his ears, and the sights blocking out most of the world, and the smells clogging his nose, it was entirely different. It was too much. Adeline herded them toward the left. He bumped into Tucker, but the rest of the crowd somehow knew to move aside to give them space. He didn't understand what Adeline was doing until the crowd parted a bit and he saw a short man dressed like Deadpool. What on earth? And then, right beside him was Iron Man. And Captain America. Colton accidentally made eye contact with Deadpool, who shuffled sideways to park himself directly in Colton's path. Take a picture with me, my man. Bewildered, Colton stopped, but only for a second because Adeline was pulling him on. She didn't even answer the guy, which Colton thought was a little rude. He would have answered him if he could have thought of anything to say. And there are your superheroes, Tucker mumbled. Adeline picked up her pace, and the crowd thinned out a little. Colton nervously looked over his shoulder to see if Deadpool was following them, but the energetic actor had found a new mark, it seemed, one who was more willing to play along. Adeline tugged him toward a small bar with a canopy over it. The place looked full, but Adeline kept going. She found them a small table that was only separated from the sidewalk by a narrow rope strung between flimsy poles. She told them both to sit and then vanished. Had she ditched them? He wouldn't blame her. He knew he wasn't being a very good date right now. For starters, he'd brought his brother. Will you please relax? Tucker said through clenched teeth. This made Colton want to punch him in the teeth. Adeline reappeared carrying a third chair. She sat beside him. Are you sure you're okay? Had he claimed that he was okay? He couldn't remember. No, he wasn't okay. He was completely overwhelmed, and his heart was breaking, and he wanted to go back to his hotel, hide his face under a pillow, and hope he didn't get stabbed by Deadpool in his sleep. 
if he could even sleep. Someone on the other side of the rope veered, staggered, and bumped into him. Then the guy laughed uproariously. Sorry, man. He stumbled to the right waving over his shoulder at the guy at the next table. You don't like it here, Adeline said. It was part observation, part question. He would rather die than hurt her feelings, but he struggled to think of a lie that would protect her. Finally he managed, I think it would take some getting used to. His eyes found Tucker, who gave him an encouraging nod. Colton was surprised by the support and grateful for it. Think of this part of the city as like an amusement park. It's not the real Las Vegas. The whole city isn't like this. She sounded sadder with every word. I live in a very nice neighborhood. Maybe you could come back someday and visit there. I'm sensing that you're not up for it tonight. There was no hint of a question at the end of that statement, and Colton felt guilty. He put his hand over hers. I'm sorry. I don't mean to insult your home. It's just not for me. This isn't my home. This is just where I work. He stared at her, but he wasn't sure what she meant. Did she mean that her neighborhood that she lived in was her home, or something else? Don't get your hopes up, a protective voice in his head whispered. A friendly server asked to take their order and then looked disappointed when they only ordered Cokes. You don't drink either? Tucker asked when the server had walked away. Adeline shook her head, and her beautiful hair bounced on her shoulders. No way. It's too much work. Tucker chuckled. I figured everybody around here did. The tourists do. They come here to drink. They come here to act out, to get away with stuff that they wouldn't do back home, but I live here. I'm not a tourist. Sorry, Tucker said. I didn't mean to suggest that you were. I know that, she said quickly. I'm not offended. I was only trying to explain that what you're looking at right now, it's not my life. Tucker gave Colton a knowing look, and he nodded to say that he had heard her. He understood what she was trying to say, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter where she lived. The point was that she was a professional dancer in a giant show. He helped high school football players in the offseason. He helped new moms lose their baby weight. They existed on two different planets. He sipped on his coke and waited for the evening to be over. Tucker was trying to make up for his silence with chit-chat, but Tucker wasn't good at it either. None of the Bridge brothers were, except for Denver. Suddenly, Colton really missed Denver. He would be doing just fine here. He looked at Tucker. Can you believe Riker came here? Oh that's right, Adeline said. Riker's girlfriend works here sometimes, right? Colton nodded. I very much doubt that he had to wander around the strip, though. He was probably closer to downtown. Still, Colton said, makes me feel kind of bad about myself, that he was able to do it, and I'm acting like a scared little kid. He'd been joking, but she didn't laugh. Instead, she rubbed his leg. You're not acting like a scared little kid. You're acting like an introvert. Trust me, you're fine. Introverts don't usually come sit on the strip unless an extrovert makes them. I appreciate you doing this with me. I've missed you. Tucker shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Colton wanted to tell her that he'd missed her too, but he avoided it, both the words and the feelings. He needed to stop feeling anything for her, and he didn't want to lead her on. Well looky there. Tucker sounded thrilled at a distraction. Colton looked over his right shoulder to see two half-naked men wearing cowboy hats. Oh boy. Is that them? Is that who? Adeline asked. I think that's them, Tucker said, not answering her question. Two drunk women latched onto them and posed for a picture. So these people just get dressed up and wander around getting their picture taken? Colton asked. That's about it, Adeline said. And people pay for that? Tucker said. He sounded like he was ready to apply for the job. Well, they do it for tips, and yes, they make pretty good money. They must, if they're willing to do that every night, Tucker said. She elbowed Colton playfully. You could make a killing. 
he bit back a laugh. Thanks, I guess. A sadness he hadn't seen before filled her eyes. Well, let me walk you guys back to the casino. She waved the server over and handed him some cash. Cokes are on me, she said, and her words sounded heavy. Sorry we're not more fun, Tucker said, giving Colton a dry look. It's okay, Adeline said. I appreciate you guys coming to the show. Chapter 33 Adeline tried to be sad. She tried to be depressed even. But she just kept coming back to mad. This made her feel childish, so she worked to get rid of her anger, but it didn't work. She ate a lot of ice cream. It didn't help. She threw extra intensity into her workout, lengthened her morning runs, and fervently prayed for deliverance from this anger, but still, mad. So, when her mother called for her weekly check-in, Adeline was a little snippy. What's wrong with you? Adeline sincerely apologized, but she had no excuse. She couldn't tell her mother what was wrong, and she didn't want to lie. What's going on, her mother pressed. Please don't be offended, mom, but it's embarrassing, and I don't want to talk about it. I'm your mother. You can't be embarrassed in front of me. Adeline laughed. That was so not true. She cared very much what her mother thought of her. She did not want her thinking that she was having a hissy fit because some boy from high school was mean to her. Even though that's exactly what was happening. Fine. Don't tell me. So, how did it go with Colton? What did he think of the show? Whoa. Had her mother connected those dots psychically or was it a coincidence? When she didn't say anything right away, her mother added a knowing, oh. Don't owe a me. It's not what you think. I'm not thinking anything. I have no idea what's going on because you won't tell me. Adeline bit her lip. She really didn't want to talk about it, but she didn't want to be mean to her mother either. Please, mom, let it go. I will as soon as you tell me what he thought of the show. I have no idea what he thought. Adeline winced. She had been actively trying to avoid an outburst, and then her mother had pushed her into one. How did she do that while acting so innocent? Well, did he say anything? Fine. She would talk. If she didn't vent, she was going to blow. He didn't say much. What he said was mean, and then he went home. I have no idea why he bothered to get on an airplane and spend that much time and energy and money because he did not enjoy it. Her mom was so quiet that Adeline checked to make sure the call hadn't been dropped. What? No wisdom to impart? She realized then that she was practically desperate for some insight. She did not understand the man, and that was really annoying. She could almost feel her mother thinking. I really don't know. You're right that it doesn't make much sense. He brought one of his brothers with him, right? Yes. Tucker. That's the one with the outfitting business? Yes. Maybe it was something with him? Were they fighting? Was Tucker ruining his time? I don't think so. Tucker appeared to be happier than Colton was, and Tucker was nicer to me. I don't understand why Colton would have been mean to you. I know. Trust me. He was nicer to me back in high school, and he wasn't nice then. So we know that you can be a little sensitive. Tell me how he was mean to you. Adeline ground her teeth together. She was sensitive, but she didn't need to be told how sensitive she was. That just made her feel more sensitive. He did not compliment me, he did not say that he enjoyed the show, and he was plain rude. He made fun of my city. He was judgmental. He was practically clutching his pearls. Oh. It sounded like she'd had an epiphany. What? What did you just figure out? He didn't like the city. I guess not, but he didn't have to be rude about it. Have I seen this show yet? Adeline flipped through her mental photo album. Her mom had come to see lots of shows, but it had been a while. If you have, it wasn't this iteration of it. Okay, but you are always wearing modest costumes during these things. She said it as a statement, but Adeline knew that it was really a question. 
Everyone has a different definition of modest. Are you suggesting that he was offended by what I was wearing on stage? I don't know. I don't know how much of a prude he is. Maybe if he's as in love with you as I think he should be, then maybe he was upset if he thought you were showing too much skin? Her blood boiled. If that is what happened, I think I'm going to strangle him. If you strangle him, you can't marry him. Despite her wrath, Adeline laughed. Seriously, though? If he is that judgmental, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think you need to talk to the man. What a novel idea. If he is a jerk, her mom said, then it's best to find out now, not after you've walked down the aisle. Just hash it out with him. Make him talk to you. Adeline was a little embarrassed that she hadn't thought of that. She'd been too busy being angry. I haven't even spoken to him since he left. Should I really call him up and holler at him? You should do what needs to be done. Maybe it's worth doing it in person. Ugh. Adeline didn't know if her knees had another flight in them. Okay. Thank you, Mom. Sometimes her mother really was bursting with wisdom. Not always, though, and she never really knew what she was going to get when she asked for advice. His new business seems to be going really well. Awesome, she thought sardonically. The parking lot is always full of cars. Really? Full of cars? Her mother was exaggerating. No gym would be full of cars in West Hope even if he were giving away memberships. Maybe I should tell him that he needs to wear more clothing when he trains pretty girls. Her mother laughed. Perfect. Maybe you guys should buy each other some snowsuits and then you could each go back to work. Chapter 34 Even growing up in a home as dark and unstable as the Bridge Ranch, Colton had never felt so downtrodden as he did now. Even when he'd realized that his college football dreams were nothing more than fantasies, he had not felt as hopeless as he did now. And he didn't understand it. He had what he'd always wanted. His own gym. Business was booming. Money was flying in through the door. He had offered the extra room to a Zumba instructor and had taken Tucker's advice to charge her rent based on her attendance. It was the easiest money he'd ever made. But something was wrong with him. It felt like a huge effort to put one foot in front of the other. He wasn't sleeping, and he had no motivation to do anything. He wondered if it was something physical that was manifesting as depression. Or was this what seasonal affective disorder felt like? It was February in South Dakota, so sad certainly made sense. Just before closing on Tuesday, Colton was at his desk looking up what vitamins and supplements to take for seasonal depression when he heard the bell over the door jingle. While he had given a key to some regulars, he wasn't expecting any of them tonight, and he certainly didn't want someone starting a workout five minutes before he was ready to leave, so he headed for the front door, ready to be irritated at what he would find there, but what he found there stopped him cold in his tracks. Adeline? He said as if he couldn't really believe she was there. With how wobbly his mental state had been lately, hallucination could have been the next logical step. Her eyes scanned the large open space. She looked nervous. I drove by an hour ago, but the parking lot was full, so I figured you were busy. He realized then that everyone had left. Unless there were some lurkers in the locker room, he and Adeline were alone. Are there any cars out there now? She shook her head. Just your truck. He went behind her to lock the door and turn the sign to closed. Are you okay? No. I am most definitely not okay. Now she sounded angry while looking nervous. Was she having a meltdown too? Did people get seasonal affective disorder in the desert? Can we sit down somewhere, she said. That is, if you have time for me. Where had that snark come from? There's really no place to sit out here. Would you like to come into my office? Without waiting for an answer, he led her toward the back. His heart thumped in his chest. What was she doing here? They hadn't talked in over a week. He moved some flyers off a chair and motioned for her to sit. She thanked him tonelessly. He sat behind the desk, but then thought that this was too formal, so without standing up he wheeled his chair around the desk to be closer to her. What's up? 
I am so mad at you. Her words caught him so off guard that he laughed, and she narrowed her eyes into a glower. What are you talking about? But he hadn't even finished his question before he knew. He had been a real jerk to her, and apparently it had had more of an effect than he thought. This surprised him. Did she really care that much what he thought or how he acted? I'm sorry, he said before she could tell him why she was mad. Sorry for what? She waited for an answer as if it were a quiz. He sighed and leaned forward to rest his elbows on his knees. I know I was a bit grumpy when I came to your show, and I'm sorry if I offended you. Sorry if you offended me? That's not a real apology. How about, sorry I was a jerk? He laughed again. He couldn't help it. Partly because he laughed when he was uncomfortable and partly because she was adorable when she was this mad. How had she hidden this anger from him that night? Had it been festering since then? Did you fly all the way here just to yell at me? Yes, I did. And then I rented a car. And drove an hour. Okay. He held both hands up in surrender. You are absolutely right. I was a jerk and I'm sorry. And if I had known that you were this angry, I would have apologized sooner. What did you think? that it wouldn't bother me? That's exactly what I thought. I'm kind of surprised that it did bother you this much. She gasped self-righteously. And there you go again, victim blaming. This time he managed to bite back the laugh. I am not blaming you. I am just kind of clueless here. Her expression softened a little. Good. His cluelessness was provoking mercy. Chapter 35 Merely being in Colton's presence was making Adeline less angry, a dynamic she found dangerous. She was trying to maintain her level of wrath when he looked her in the eyes and said, tell me how I can make it up to you. His gaze could melt Kevlar. Did he even know why she was mad? She wasn't confident that he had a good understanding of what he'd done wrong. She also wasn't confident that he needed to. He was obviously sorry. He was obviously back to his old self. I thought we were going to be friends, she said softly. He leaned back in his chair. We are friends. She scowled. Good. More anger, the anger was coming back. Friends don't act like that. Why did you fly to Las Vegas? If you didn't want to see my show. Of course I wanted to see your show. She waited for more. He sighed. Look, the city just wasn't for me. I know that's not your fault, and I don't want you to be insulted by it, but it obviously had nothing to do with you. She shook her head. That wasn't obvious, Colton. You sat through my show, so you hadn't been outside in the city for two hours. But you were still so upset by the city that you couldn't say something nice to me after my show? He winced, and she was glad to have struck a nerve. I didn't realize that I hadn't said anything nice to you. Adeline, you were amazing. You are a superstar. You were the most amazing thing I've ever seen. His expression grew sad. I guess I just assumed that you knew all that. She did know all of that on some level. She had been praised for her dancing all of her life, but that didn't mean that she didn't want to hear it from him. It is one thing to impress people in the dance world. I wanted to impress you. He looked surprised. Consider me impressed. He had said the words, but she didn't feel it. Maybe it wasn't true. Maybe she hadn't impressed him. And that was okay. They could still be friends. It wasn't like he was going to be coming to another show soon. We were texting. I liked talking to you. I liked having you in my life, and then ever since the show, you have ghosted me. This wasn't quite fair because she had ghosted him too. She'd been too angry to text him. He tipped his head back and stared at the ceiling. She gave him time as it appeared he was trying to make a decision. Finally, he said, okay. I don't remember the last time that I have been vulnerable, and I'm not really enjoying the feeling. She bit her lip with anticipation. He sucked in some air. I like you, Adeline. We only spend a few days together on New Year's, 
but I really, his eyes locked on her, and she felt their heat. I really grew quite attached. I flew to Las Vegas with this ridiculous notion of asking you to be more than friends, she opened her mouth to interrupt, but he didn't let her, but then I saw you in your element. I saw who you really are, and I just knew that I was being ridiculous. So yes, that was very disappointing, and I have been disappointed ever since. His spine straightened, and then he picked up his chin. I'm a grown man. I will get over it. But yes, if you're going to make me say it, that is why I was grumpy, and I'm sorry. And that is why I have ghosted you because it's easier not to talk to you than to talk to you knowing what I know now. She thought she had a pretty good understanding of what he was saying, but she didn't know how to respond yet, so she asked, and what is it that you know now? That you are a professional. That you live in a different world. And there is nothing wrong with that. I am happy for you. But I know that we can't be together. I'm glad we made a silly pact in high school, and I'm glad that we reunited so that I could appreciate who you've become, but let's be realistic. She stood then and closed the gap between them. She held out a hand. He looked at it as if he weren't sure what it was for, but then he took it. She gave him a little tug, and he pushed himself out of the chair. Then she wrapped her arms around his neck and pressed her lips to his. She pulled away and caressed his cheek as she looked into his eyes. Colton Bridge, I have been in love with you since the fifth grade. That is why I suggested that stupid pact. Of course I didn't think it would happen, but over and over again I did silly little things back then to tell you how I felt. For crying out loud, I practically dedicated my whole life to you in that yearbook. He laughed, and she wrapped one arm around his waist and pulled him closer. I admit, the circumstances aren't ideal. I don't know what to do about the two different worlds that we live in, but I can tell you that I'm not too professional for you or too much of a superstar for you. Are you kidding? You're Colton Bridge. He scowled. You say that like it's something special. Well, it is. And if you don't know that, I guess I need to help you see it. And how do you intend to do that? I have no idea, she admitted. But I don't think that not speaking to each other and me stewing in my anger is the way. He chuckled. I didn't know you were capable of such anger. You have no idea. He sighed and kissed her on the top of the head. I have been so depressed since I left Las Vegas. She was sorry to hear that he had been depressed, but it was good news. So did you have a speech planned for me? What? No, I didn't even know you were coming. She laughed and rolled her eyes. This guy was such a dude. I meant in Las Vegas. Oh. Yeah. So? Can I hear it? She leaned into him playfully. He looked terrified, which made her feel powerful and then guilty for feeling so powerful. He let out a long sigh. Are you sure? It's so stupid. Now she was getting angry again. She was usually so emotionally stable. Maybe this man wasn't healthy for her. He stared at her for several seconds and then took her hand gently. Come on. He led her out into the large room and across to the opposite wall, where a door stood open. They stepped through it, and he flicked on a light switch. She gasped. It was a dance studio. What is this? When you were here in South Dakota for New Year's, I didn't know what I had yet. The previous owner had just filled this space full of junk, so I thought of it as the spare room, but once I had spent time with you, I saw it differently. I had this crazy idea that you would be excited to move to small town West Hope and open a dance school. But then I went and saw what your real life is like and realized how ridiculous that was. He squeezed her hand. And I'm not saying that it's impossible. I would rather have part of you part of the time than live without you, but yeah, this is why I went to Las Vegas. I thought I was making this big grand gesture, but really I was offering you half a donut. She laughed half of a donut? She didn't even like donuts. He shrugged. I don't know. It's what came to mind. She didn't know what to think. This offer was far more enticing than he thought it was. Yes. He furrowed his brow. Yes, what? Does the offer still stand? 
Did you give it to someone else? Well, they do Zumba in here, but I can put a stop to that. She giggled. Well, I would need to give a few weeks' notice at work, and I might even need to finish out this show, depending on my contract. I never actually read those things anymore. But yes. If you don't mind waiting. He jumped into the air, and she laughed. Then he picked her up and spun her around. Are you serious? You're insane. Maybe a little. Colton, I don't want part of you part of the time. We could build a life here. A real life. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we could put down roots and build our own world together that we both live in. His face was absolutely beaming, and she was so proud that she could make this man this happy. And then, just like that, the happiness slipped away so suddenly that she wondered if he was having some sort of seizure. Colton? Sorry. He blinked. It just occurred to me. What? The suspense was killing her. Is it because of your knees? Is what because my knees? Is that why you're ready to stop dancing? No as she playfully slapped his chest. Are you serious? I mean, yes, eventually they're going to give out for good, but I'm not there yet. She pretended to be offended. Are you calling me old and worn out? He laughed, and it was a relief to her ears. Okay. Just checking. She stood on her tiptoes and kissed him again, trying to make him feel what she was feeling. Why can't you believe that I'm in love with you, that I want to be with you? He shook his head. You just seem so far out of my league. I probably am, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. They laughed together, and then she kissed him again. Colton, she said, pulling away. I love Las Vegas. The city has been good to me, and I'm grateful. But I have also missed South Dakota. Las Vegas can be lonely. I really would love to come home. He leaned in for another kiss before saying, You have no idea how much I love hearing you call this place home. Chapter 36 Colton had never been so excited about anything. Well, maybe his junior year when the West Hope Lions had gone to the South Dakota State Championship, but then they'd lost. This was different. He wasn't going to lose this time. Adeline had told him that she wouldn't officially open for business until the fall, which felt like Ian's away. He was trying to be patient. There's a big difference between dancing in a show and teaching kids how to dance, she'd said. She had to do some research. Train herself. She wanted to go observe other dance teachers in the area. He told her that she was going to have to leave West Hope for that so she'd taken a look at what the Las Vegas dance studios were doing. He wasn't sure how helpful that was going to be in preparation for West Hope kids, but he didn't voice his doubts. Colton had been so excited that he'd blurted something regrettable out at the ranch. He had been helping Gunner fix yet another fence those dumb goats had destroyed, and Cash had wandered outside to watch them work. Knowing little Polly loved to dance, Colton had excitedly shared that Adeline could be her dance teacher. Cash had squished up his face and said, I don't know, man. She's such a free spirit. Not sure I want to contain her in a straight line, with routines and stuff. If Colton hadn't had his hands full, he might have punched Cash in the teeth. You should ask Polly, Gunner said to Cash and then tried to change the subject. In your gym? Cash said, dodging Gunner's attempts. Yes. There's a big room that's going to be Adeline's new dance school. You ever thought about goat yoga? Cash said. Assuming that he was joking, Colton glared at him. He was serious. Uh... No. Are you sure? There's big money in it. Cash was insane. There weren't enough yoga types in West Hope to justify a normal yoga class, let alone one with goats. No, Colton said again. Cash looked at Gunner. It would be good for the goats too. No, Gunner said without looking up from his fence post. That had been the end of the goat yoga conversation, and Colton hadn't tried to recruit any more dance students since. He didn't need to. Adeline's reputation combined with local parents' desire not to drive their kids to Rapid would recruit enough students to build a program. His phone rang, and he rolled over to answer it. 
he'd been watching TV in bed. Actually, he'd been staring at the screen and thinking about Adeline. Hey, gorgeous. She was being playful, but her greeting still made him warm all over. Hey, yourself. So I have to tell you something. Uh-oh. It's not bad news, but just hear me out until the end, okay? Okay. This certainly sounded like bad news was incoming. I thought about not telling you at all, but then I'm such a bad secret keeper that I thought I would accidentally mention it later. Adeline, just tell me. Okay. So my boss offered me a job today. She already had a job, one she was resigning from. I don't understand. She sucked in some air, and he braced himself. They invited me to join the choreography team. She kept talking, explaining what that meant, but he struggled to follow her. But don't worry, she finally said, I turned it down. I don't understand, he said again. She laughed and then went through it again, more slowly this time. She'd been helping that department out in small ways for years, so they made the invitation official. She would start out as more of an assistant, mostly implementing and teaching the choreography that someone else created, but it was really an amazing offer, and she was flattered. But you said no, he said, hating that he sounded like a big dumb oaf. Of course I did. She paused. Are you okay? Maybe I shouldn't have told you. No, no, I'm not so fragile that you need to protect me from your good news. At least, he was trying not to be. Congratulations. Thank you. I think it might be the equivalent of going from football player to offensive coordinator. Yeah, he wasn't so sure, but he congratulated her again because he didn't know what else to say. They chatted for another 20 minutes or so, and then she told him to get some sleep. I love you, he said, and I really can't wait to say that in person every night. Ditto. She giggled. I love you too. Good night. He ended the call and turned off the TV. Then he tried to fall asleep, but he was suddenly wide awake. Chapter 37 Adeline was sitting on her couch eating a salad when someone knocked on her door. No one ever stopped by without texting first, so she assumed it was someone she didn't know and didn't want to see. Still chewing, she tiptoed to the door to look out her peephole. She gasped and accidentally inhaled some Caesar dressing. She started coughing and a crouton fell out of her mouth. Though she thought she might be about to die from asphyxiation, she was mostly sad about the crouton. Are you okay, in there? His voice came through the door soft as velvet. She had so many things to do at once that she froze with indecision. She had to keep coughing because she couldn't stop it. She had to get the door open, but first she had to find some place to set her salad down. Hang on, she tried to call out, but it came out strangled. He laughed softly. Take your time. Are you sick? She hurried to the kitchen, put the salad on the counter, got herself a drink of water, took a single sip, and then ran back to the door, still coughing. She ripped the door open and leapt into his arms. What are you doing here, she said between coughs. Tears rolled down her cheeks. His body shook with laughter as he held her. When he set her down, she grabbed his hand and pulled him into the apartment, eager to shut the door before one of her nosy neighbors decided to initiate a chat. What are you doing here, she said again. He looked more gorgeous than ever. And how did you, cough, cough, get here? Slow down. Why are you coughing like that? Have you taken up smoking since I last saw you? There was more coughing as she shook her head. I inhaled some Caesar dressing. He winced dramatically. Sounds painful. She nodded and coughed as she pointed to the couch. Sit. Sit. After retrieving her glass of water, she sat beside him. She took a sip and stared at him, waiting for him to explain. He reached out and took her hand. Can't a guy come see his girl? She shook her head, afraid speaking would bring on more coughing. He laughed. To answer your question, no, I didn't fly. I drove. What? She cried. It's like a 12-hour drive. More like 16. Anyway, I had to see you. 
Oh no. What was wrong? What about your gym? You just took off in the middle of the week? He nodded. Kasha's girlfriend Bella is babysitting the gym, so it will be fine. I drove through the night. And it turns out that driving through Wyoming in the middle of the night in February is kind of scary. How are you going to get back? She managed to ask this without coughing. I think I'm going to go through New Mexico, pretend that I've been longing to visit Denver. Anyway. I'm here with a purpose. She nodded eagerly. Okay. Had he come to propose? If so, the answer was yes. Adeline, I think you should take the job. What? What job? He waited, giving his words a chance to sink in. Why would you say that? Was he breaking up with her? I got to thinking about how much fun it would be to be an offensive coordinator. She laughed. He'd lost his mind. This is a career opportunity, right? Maybe you'd be selling yourself short if you moved to West Hope to teach little girls how to count to eight. You should take this job. I can move here. It was a good thing she wasn't chewing food anymore because that one might have killed her. Are you joking? You hate it here. He nodded. Hate is a strong word. I would adjust because I'd be with you. And every town needs personal trainers. There's probably a bigger demand here than in West Hope. There was no probably about it. But you own your own gym in West Hope. I know. But I can sell it. The point is, Adeline, all that matters is you. And I don't want my fear of something different to get in the way of your dreams. As if she hadn't fallen far enough in love with him. Can I tell you about my dream? He nodded. Of course. I love to dance. But my dream is to be with you. My dream is to have a slow, calm, peaceful life surrounded by good people. I don't want to freak you out or anything, but my dream is to marry you and to have cute little dancers in our own house. I've lived the fun life, the fast life, and it's been great. I'm grateful. But now I'm ready for what's next. She tried to read his expression, but it was tough. Was that relief or only exhaustion? Would you like to take a nap? He laughed. Maybe. Are you sure? I really thought you'd go for this. She tucked her feet up onto the cushion beside her and snuggled into his side. Maybe you don't know me as well as you think you do. Obviously not. Good. If you'd like to get to know me better, I think I would enjoy that. He put his arm around her and pulled her closer. Can I tell you about my dream? As long as you don't say it's to move to Las Vegas. It's definitely not, though I would do that for you. My dream is to run my own gym, to help people get healthy, and to make money doing it, because money gives people choices. Money would allow me to take care of you and to take care of our children. My dream is to marry you, raise a family, and grow old with you watching our grandkids run around the lawn. You mean dance around the lawn? Sure. Maybe. Some of them will be playing football. Okay. But they might be dancing in the off-season. He winced, and she laughed. That's a good dream, she said. Was that a marriage proposal? Absolutely not. I've got to think of something big and dramatic and romantic before you get a ring. She laughed again. Okay, just please don't hide it in a dessert or something because knowing me, I will choke on it. Chapter 38 Colton stood in the fairway checkout line, staring down at his phone. He had convinced Adeline to host a kickoff dance camp and had mistakenly convinced her to do it in July, it was hotter than the blue blazes out there. The studio's air conditioning was struggling to keep up. He had offered to put a new unit in, but Adeline had argued that she probably wouldn't be in there the following July and that they could tough it out this summer. So he had stopped by the grocery store to pick up some popsicles, hoping to cool the girls off before they got picked up. It had been an impressive turnout, and he was thrilled to see that studio packed with little girls excited about dancing, but all that body heat made it all the more oppressive. As he waited, he scrolled through some search results for romantic proposal ideas. It had to have been the hundredth time he had googled this, and he didn't know why he kept trying because nothing he found felt right. He'd read hundreds of ideas. 
some of them would cost more than he would make in a lifetime. The rest were just dumb. He couldn't afford to hire her favorite band for a backyard concert, and he wasn't going to write the proposal in shaving cream. The clerk greeted him, and he looked up, quickly putting his phone away. It was useless anyway. He was going to have to come up with something on his own. Again, he wished that he could consult his mother. Maybe he was going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, take Adeline to a restaurant and get down on one knee. But that didn't feel like enough. Their relationship was so weird, he didn't want to give her an ordinary proposal. He handed over his money and thanked the clerk as she handed him a plastic sack full of ice. Then he hurried back to the gym before it could melt. He ended up getting there a little early, and they were still dancing. Well, if they could call it that. They were still running around chaotically to music. But it was adorable. And Adeline was glowing. If he'd had any doubts that she would enjoy this, they were gone now. She seemed to be very much in her element. And the little girls loved her. Miss Adeline. Miss Adeline. Often they didn't even have anything to say after that, they were only vying for her attention. She turned off the music with her phone and then eyed the bag in his hand before raising her eyebrows. He nodded. I brought some cold treats. Adeline praised the girls and told them to work on their stretches tonight before asking them if any of them would like a treat. What a silly question. They all cheered their response, and he quickly strode across the floor to hand the bag over before he was attacked by a horde of little girls in ponytails. Then he stepped back to watch her open the box and hand them out one by one. It was the most beautiful scene he'd ever witnessed, and he was really proud of himself for thinking of popsicles. He knew from experience that it would be a while before all the girls got picked up, so he went to his office to check his email. He had several, nothing pressing, but he still lingered there because if he had to wait, he might as well do it in his new ergonomically correct chair. Adeline appeared in his doorway just as he was about to do another fruitless internet search for proposal ideas. They can't all be gone already, he said. She nodded. They are. We got lucky. I've learned one thing. I'm going to have them sign a contract at the beginning of the official dance year. These parents are going to promise to pick the kids up on time. The word contract gave him an idea. He hesitated as he considered it. Are you okay? Yeah. Hey, do you have a few minutes? I'd like to show you something. Of course. Did you think I had big plans? He chuckled, grabbed what he needed out of his desk drawer, slid it into his pocket, and then stood and went to her. On their way out of the gym, he stopped to talk to Bella. She'd been helping out at the gym so much that he'd put her on the payroll for the summer. I'll be back in an hour or so. You're in charge. She gave him a playful salute. You got it, boss. When Colton pulled his truck into the high school parking lot, Adeline looked at him with suspicion. This is what you wanted to show me? He chuckled. Not yet. He got out and tried to open the door for her, but as usual, she beat him to it. He took her hand and led her to the 50-yard line. The field was deserted. Suddenly, nerves attacked his belly, and he realized this wasn't quite right. He walked her to the 40-yard line instead. She giggled. Colton, what is wrong with you? Before he could lose his nerve or start googling again, he dropped to one knee. She gasped and threw her hands over her mouth so that her, oh my goodness, came out muffled. I've been trying to think of a big, dramatic, romantic proposal idea, and I've been failing, but I don't want to wait one more second, so you're going to have to put up with this high school version. She didn't even let him get the question out. She dropped to her knees and pressed her lips to his. She pulled away briefly to say yes, and then kissed him again. Feeling self-conscious that someone might catch them, he stood and pulled her to her feet. But then he couldn't resist kissing her again. He wanted to spend the rest of his life kissing this woman. This smart band girl. This tuba player. This professional dancer. Oh no. He'd forgotten about the ring. He broke the kiss and reached into his pocket to pull out the little velvet box. She gasped again. There's a ring? Yes, I botched the proposal. 
Sorry. You didn't botch anything. Your proposal is perfect. It suits us. She held her hand out, and he slid the ring onto her finger. It was a perfect fit. Yes, I suppose that it does suit us, he said. And you suit me, Adeline Sharp. You suit me too. I love you so much. Those silly words I said back then were the smartest words I ever uttered. He nodded. I am beyond grateful for those very silly, smart words. They turned to go, and Adeline stopped and looked out at the field. Remember when we thought this football field was the whole world? He chuckled and kissed her just above her temple. I don't know. I think it served me pretty well. Epilogue Adeline stopped gazing into Colton's eyes to see who was striding across the Honeywood lawn toward them. A woman in a bubblegum-colored pantsuit held out her hand and smiled brightly. Hi, I'm Keely Honeywood. They each shook her hand. You look super familiar to me, Adeline said. Did you grow up around here? Keely shook her head. Sorry. I'm from Alabama. Sweet home Alabama, Colton muttered, and Adeline giggled. Keely looked confused. Are you from Alabama? she asked Colton. Uh. No, sorry. Colton looked at his feet. I just like that movie. Keely seemed a bit baffled by that, but she didn't comment. I'm sorry, Adeline said. This is going to drive me nuts. I know you, and I've been living in Las Vegas for the last 12 years. Keeley's eyebrows went up. My husband and I went to Las Vegas for a hospitality conference a while back. Maybe we bumped into each other there? What were the chances of that? Las Vegas had about a hundred thousand visitors a day. And then she had it. She gasped. Your husband. Is he the cat whisperer? For less than a second, Keeley looked confused, but then she understood. Yes. She laughed brightly. That was Chase. I take it that you were on that plane? I was. I was right beside him when he did it. The cat was right under me. That's so cool, Keeley said. Small state, Colton said. I suppose in a way, it is, Keeley said. Well, she spread her arms out, welcome to our ranch. Would you like to see the wedding barn? Yes, please. Adeline said. They followed her across the property and into what looked like an old barn with an addition built onto it. Adeline gasped when she stepped inside. It was gorgeous, every bit as serene as she'd imagined. She looked up at Colton. What do you think? I think it's a barn. She knew that he hadn't meant to sound cynical, but he'd managed anyway. It's not just a barn, Adeline said. It's a nice barn with parking. Do you really think Gunnar is going to let us get married in his barn? Good point. Although it would be more convenient because then we wouldn't have to truck General Lee over here. The horror on Colton's face made her laugh out loud. Did you think that I was joking when I said we were having a goat for a wedding guest? Yes. You were joking. Come on, Colton. She knew that she didn't have to beg. She knew that he wouldn't really stop her. At least, she thought she knew that. You know that we have her to thank for our happily ever after. I think that's a stretch, and I'm not thanking a goat, especially not one that peed in my truck. Adeline laughed. Well, you should. She folded her arms across her chest and pretended to be mad. That goat did not bring us together. We met in kindergarten. Adeline was amused at how closely Keeley was following their conversation and how entertained she appeared to be. That's true, Adeline said, but it was that night, after that knee injury. That's when I really knew. Knew what? That it wasn't just a high school crush. That I was really in love with you. He scoffed, you're just saying that because you want a goat at your wedding. Keeley tried to hide her laugh by turning away. Adeline shook her head. Nope, it's the truth. Fine, he growled. We can give that stupid goat some of the credit. She laughed and stood on her tiptoes to kiss his cheek. 
Do you have any sort of rules about animals participating? Colton asked Keeley. I mean, I know that this is a barn, but there's going to be a lot of people here. No problem at all, Keeley said. People include dogs all the time. Colton gave Adeline some side eye before saying, A dog makes sense. Dogs are pets. A goat makes sense too, Keeley said, since you have a goat rescue. I don't have much to do with that. That's all my brother Gunner. Oh, Keeley said. Is he married? Only to the goats, Colton said, and Adeline elbowed him. Well, Keeley said, if he decides to get married, please tell him that he can do it here, and he can bring as many goats as he wants. I will let him know. Adeline couldn't imagine Gunner getting married. He was too much of a recluse. The goat won't actually be in the wedding, she felt Colton relax on her arm, but she might be a guest outside. In that case, we could get a donkey too, Colton said. Adeline swooned. Enough, she thought. I can't fall any deeper in love with you. Save that for an anniversary gift. Keeley looked baffled again. Sorry, Adeline said. I know we're a little weird. Keeley smiled. You have no idea the weird I've seen. You guys are fun. Just let us know what you need, be it livestock or anything else, and no pressure at all, but if you are ready to talk scheduling, I should tell you that we do fill up quickly. Adeline didn't want to delay this any more than necessary. How soon can you have us? We are full for the next year, Adeline's stomach sank, but we reserve some weekends for locals. Why? Colton asked. I mean, that's kind of you, but I'm curious. Hudson, the original owner of the business, really cares about the people around here. And the rest of us agree that it's a good idea to try to attract local people because then they'll spend their money in West Hope instead of going somewhere else to get married. All of our contractors, from caterer to DJ to cleaning crew, are from West Hope. That's so cool, Colton said, and Adeline could feel his wheels turning. Stop thinking about business. We are planning our wedding right now. Keeley laughed. Sorry, Colton said. We have an opening in June. The third weekend. How does that sound? Or if you want to go sooner, we could have a weekday wedding. June sounds awesome, Adeline said and then looked to Colton for confirmation, which he gave with a nod. You'll want to make sure your pastor is available, or whoever is going to marry you, unless you want us to provide someone. No need, Adeline said quickly. I am certain he will be available. Keeley looked a little confused, so Adeline explained, we asked our old youth group leader to do the ceremony. He had to go online to get the official certificate, but now he's ready. Keeley obviously didn't understand their reasoning, but that was okay. Adeline smiled up at Colton. We still need to make sure the goat is available, but assuming she is, go ahead and book us. Adeline laughed. She was so giddy that she had to work to keep her feet on the ground. She could not wait to marry this man.